Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council um, meeting on July 27th. We have two proclamations this morning. The first, um, I asked for a memorial event to recognize our county employees who were lost in the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. We will begin with a proclamation in their honor. We will now, we will begin with a, a seven minute in memoriam video that will be played for the five Montgomery County employees who passed away due to COVID-19. The individuals covered in the tribute are Linal Dove from the Department of Recreation, Michael Miller and Nelvin Ransom from the Department of Transportation, David Allen from our Department of Technology and Business Enterprise Solutions, and Blanca Kling from the Montgomery County Police Department. We are grateful to be joined by Bria Viegas, the granddaughter of Nelvin Ransom, Michelle Dove, Stephanie Dove, and Rick Dove, here for Linal Dove, Jason Kling and Lizzie Kling for Blanca Kling, and Donna Miller, who lost her husband, Michael Miller. All of us on the County Council are so terribly sorry for your losses, and we're glad you could join us this morning. The pandemic has affected us and, and every one of us in immeasurable ways, and as we emerge from the pandemic and try to recover as best we can, we have to acknowledge that for some, the pain and loss will remain forever. So today, we're gonna take a few minutes to remember all those we lost in our community, our state, and our country, and the amazing individuals we lost, grandparents, friends, all the loved ones we lost to this unspeakable pandemic, particularly our county employees that, that uh, we lost in the, in the service of, of keeping our, our county residents safe during this, this horrible pandemic. We must also never lose sight of the glaring inequities that the pandemic has shined a spotlight on and be, recommit ourselves to continuing to address them. Can we begin with the video? Blanca Kling was just 17 years old when she left her home country of Bolivia and moved to Maryland, the first in her family to migrate to the United States. She attended Bethesda Chevy Chase High School and Montgomery College, a dedicated county employee who spent more than 40 years serving the Montgomery County Police Department. Blanca began her career in 1980 as a victim assistant in Wheaton's 4th District, a job that took her to crime scenes and victims' homes. As more Spanish speakers moved into Montgomery County in the 80s, Blanca began volunteering almost daily at community centers to connect new immigrants with social services. She transitioned into working in the Public Information Division of the department in 2005. It was in that role that she strengthened communication between the police and Hispanic community members. Kling, who was affectionately known as Blanquita, became a familiar face in the Hispanic community, hosting town hall meetings, appearing on Spanish television, and assisting investigators when they needed her. She embraced all of these roles with grace and compassion while making deep connections in the community. Blanca Kling leaves behind Tony, her husband of more than 40 years, daughter Lizzie, son Jason, daughter-in-law Rachel, and twin grandsons Noah and Matthias. David Mitchell Allen was born on September 13, 1969 in Baltimore, Maryland. He joined Montgomery County in 2004 as a senior IT specialist in the Department of Technology Services. Over the course of his distinguished career, Dave worked as a project manager on a number of important projects, including the public safety systems and integrated justice systems modernization efforts. He was known for his strong work ethic, leadership skills, and dry sense of humor. He was smart, enthusiastic, and he loved to solve problems, especially the technical ones. Dave loved Nationals baseball, riding his bike, and dogs. He shined in his role as husband and father. Dave Allen leaves behind his beloved wife, Jenny, and daughter, Yumi. Linol Dove began her career in the Department of Recreation in the late 1980s as a summer camp director. In 2012, Linol became a full-time employee in recreation where she worked in financial operations. 
Even as she moved on professionally and in her personal life, she remained an anchor in the Scotland community and worked diligently to support and bring opportunities to the neighborhood. Lenol had a smile that could light up any space and a heart full of joy and passion for her family and for her colleagues who were like family to her. She could be counted on to always help any staff member who asked. Lenol was known to drop everything, look up with a smile, and then tackle the project. She was a coach, a mentor, a friend, and a mad bingo player. Above all else, Lenol's family was her whole life. She cherished her time with her family and loved ones and lovingly included her recreation teammates in her family unit. While Lenol experienced some health concerns, COVID-19 served as an unexpected coda to her life. She fought the disease quietly, tirelessly, sadly, as her family could not be there to comfort her. Lenol Dove passed away due to complications of COVID-19 on June 6, 2020. In 2011, Michael Miller began working for Montgomery County as a ride on bus operator and moved on to become a motor pool operator at the Silver Spring Depot. He took pride in his work and would always have a smile on his face. He was a dedicated employee. His wife Donna often joked that he spent more time at the depot than he did at home. Outside work, Michael was heavily involved in the fraternal organizations Prince Hall Masonry and the Shriners, where he volunteered at soup kitchens and helped to host charitable events. Every year for DOT's Given Ride Week, Michael would come to the depot the weekend before to personally outfit the 140 buses with bags for donations, and he also collected the donations for area food banks. Michael enjoyed watching movies, dancing, backyard barbecues, a good cigar, but his greatest enjoyment was camping with his family. He was affectionately known as Rock. He was truly the rock of his family or to anyone who needed assistance. Once he considered you a friend, it was forever. Michael Miller is survived by his wife of 31 years, Donna, sons Joshua and Jonathan, an adopted daughter, Demetrius, and three granddaughters, Marquia, Brittany, and Logan. Melvin Ransom started working for Montgomery County in 1989 as a ride on bus operator. He became a shop steward after just a few short years and was an active member of UFCW Local 1994, the Montgomery County Government Employees Organization. In 2006, he was elected to the executive board and ultimately rose to the office of recorder, a position he held until November 30th of 2020. Nelvin was a fierce warrior for the entire labor movement, fighting on the front lines of dozens of battles across the country, continually pushing for social and economic justice for all working families. Nelvin was the union's point person for over 1,000 of its members, including Ride-On, DGS, Fire and Rescue, and other members in the union. He was beloved by all. His dedication and commitment to his union family was always at the forefront. Nelvin never shied away from lending a helping hand, a kind ear, a friendly handshake, or a big bear hug. One of Nelvin's biggest strengths was his amazing ability to connect with everyone he met despite any difference that may have existed. In his passing, the labor movement has lost a giant. Nelvin Ransom was preceded in death by his wife Lenora. He leaves behind a number of family members and a wide swath of friends. Thank you so much to Ms. Kennedy and our, our entire video team um, for that wonderful tribute. Now we will read the proclamation uh, with council members reading it in alphabetical order following the council vice president and myself. Do all my colleagues have it? Okay, um, so it begins, whereas we remember all those lost to the horrific COVID-19 pandemic, including the more than 1,580 community members who have perished in Montgomery County the 9,589 residents we have lost across the state of Maryland, and the 608,528 people who have died across our nation. And 
Whereas, even when the pandemic ends, the pain and loss will remain for so many family members and friends who are desperately missing their loved ones. And? Whereas, the beautiful souls we lost include grandparents, parents, siblings, spouses, extended family, friends, colleagues, and coworkers. And? Whereas, we remember each person, the lives they lived, and how much this pandemic has forever changed families and communities. And? No, Councilor yeah. Orlando is not here. Okay, Where, whereas we recognize the sacrifices and heroic efforts of our tireless healthcare workers, first responders, public health leaders, frontline workers, essential service providers, and community volunteers whose dedication and commitment helped guide us through this enormous challenge. We are forever grateful for all you have done and? Whereas, whereas we acknowledge that this pandemic has hit black and brown communities disproportionately hard, and we reaffirm our commitment to fight against all inequity to ensure that no community gets left behind. And whereas we are grateful to Montgomery County residents for doing their part to slow the spread of the virus by wearing masks, social distancing, avoiding large gatherings, getting tested and vaccinated and? Whereas with safe and effective vaccinations that slowed and will ultimately eliminate the spread of COVID-19, we appreciate our researchers who developed the vaccines and our vaccinators for vaccinating our residents and? Whereas these vaccines and the collective action of our residents has made it possible to conquer this virus and emerge stronger as a community because we are Montgomery strong. Now, therefore, be it resolved <clears throat> that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby mourns and remembers those who lost their lives to COVID-19. And be it further resolved that Montgomery County, Maryland reaffirms its commitment to following the guidance of our public health professionals and leading based on public health data and science presented on this 27th day of July in the year 2021. Do any of you wish to say a few words? Oh, if I can, I'm sorry, I'm emotional. Um, just to everybody here, I just want to say thank you. And for my grandpa's sake, he loved everybody. And it's not just me, it's my other granddaughter, my other sisters, and my brother, Gabby, Gianna, and Bryson, who loved Nelvin so much and appreciated everybody. And everyone who knew him know that he had, like, the precious soul. And he was my best friend. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> sorry. So I thank you guys so much. And thank it's been you. a hard seven months. So thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you so very much. Again, it's it's been a little over a year um, and three months for me. But to know that Michael is still being remembered um, by Montgomery County, it's, it's truly an honor um, for me. And um, like I said, he he loved his ride on family. Um, oftentimes, to me, they came first, and so um, just just to have this honor and for him to be remembered is just very touching for me and the family, and just makes it a little bit easier for me. So, thank you so very much. Very much. Also, um, my name is Michelle Dove. I am the aunt to Lenal Dove, who was one of, who is one of many. Um, I'd also like to thank the County Council, the Montgomery County Department of Recreation, and everybody for the thoughts, the prayers, and the remembrances. Um, Lenore was definitely a shiner. Um, wherever she went, she lit up the room. And for us, it's been, a, it was a year on June 6th, and it has been seriously the worst year of my life. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Jason Kling, the son of son of Blanca. Just wanted to first start off by thanking everyone in the in the council for for what you what you've done today and all that you've done to you know make uh, families like mine feel supported. Today is the uh, happens to be the six month anniversary of my mom's passing, and uh, yeah, it, it feels like we've you know lost simultaneously. Yet. Uh, an important figure in the county, uh, a co-worker to too many in the police and 
um, but also a, a mother and a, and a grandmother. And the loss is still still uh, very deep. But um, I, I really thank you for your tireless efforts, all that you're you're doing in the county to prevent more losses from happening, especially fighting for you know eliminating the inequalities in, in in black and brown communities and 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 all the all the work that comes in to vaccinating and getting the message out um it's more, it seems like right now is the timing is really important right now that things are also seeming seem to get tougher and we really appreciate all all that you're doing and all that you've done to uh honor honor our, our family members my mom um and and support our family so th thank you all god bless you all thank you Anyone else? Okay. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we we are very, very sorry for your loss um, and we will never forget your, your loved ones and, and all they did for our county and our residents. Thank you so much. Stay in touch with us. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to be, be helpful. <clears throat> Next, everyone, is a proclamation recognizing fibroid awareness month fibroids a common health issue long affecting women particularly african-american women are benign tumors that grow in women of childbearing age and can lead to very serious health consequences fibroids are a leading reason for hysterectomies in the, in the united states during fibroid awareness month this july we are working to raise awareness for this overwhelmingly common yet under discussed condition that is affecting so many women all over the world by bringing this issue to the forefront Research and funding will be more prevalent and women will gain more confidence talking through their treatment options with their physician. I would like to thank the many advocates who are working so hard on this issue, including the White Dress Project and Care About Fibroids. We are fortunate enough to be joined by Care About Fibroids Senior Policy Advisor and former U.S. Health and Human Services Deputy Assistant Secretary for Women's Health, Dr. Nancy Lee. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for being with us, with us this morning. Without further ado, I'll recognize Councilmember Navarro for her remarks and then you, and we can read the proclamation. Council Member Namara. Thank you, Mr. President. As I try to uh, get myself together here, <laughs> this has been uh, a very uh, sad morning mm -hmm. thus far, but I so much appreciate the opportunity to join you for this proclamation because it is an absolutely important topic uh, for many, many women. Uh, this is not something that is discussed as much options are not discussed as much and many of us have just suffered in silence thinking that it's just something more that we have to address i am uh, one of those women that suffered from fibroid and had to have a hysterectomy ultimately and again i find that especially for younger women we must raise the awareness that it is something that we should bring up, that we should discuss, that we should carefully study all the different options, uh, because it is extraordinarily disruptive. And I oftentimes used to say, you know, literally like two to three weeks out of the month, I was dealing with some kind of um, implication due to uh, this condition. And uh, imagine when you're a professional, an elected official, and you're doing whatever you need to do, it is quite disruptive. And so it's very, very important. Uh, and um, I, I thank also, you know, Dr. Lee for um, raising this awareness again about an issue and a condition that is quite widespread, but not talked enough about, not mm -hmm. discussed enough about. And therefore, we need to make this truly an ongoing education uh, initiative. So thank you so much for letting me join and you know, share my own experience um, because we do need to uh, make sure that everybody understands that this is a lot more common that, that we think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Nuato. Dr. Lee. Good morning. First, my condolences to the family and friends of the Montgomery County employees that were memorialized this morning. It's, it's a tough day, I know, for them and a tough what, year and a half now? Um, thank you, Council President Hucker, for including Care About Fibroids in this important event today. We are excited to join you in the presentation of this proclamation during Fibroids Awareness Month. 
This proclamation is an important step in raising awareness about uterine fibroids and its impact on women who are living with this condition, as Councilwoman Navarro has already mentioned. Using your platform, you are spotlighting the women's health condition and joining in a growing effort to bring uterine fibroids out of the shadows. Our hope is that this will build momentum for more education and research into uterine fibroids. We are grateful to have your support and the support of Montgomery County to, quote, bring awareness to this common yet under-discussed health issue and invest in public health to improve the health outcomes of all of our residents, close quote. Hopefully this will set an example for communities around the country to join us in efforts to raise awareness about uterine fibroids that will improve the lives of our mothers, sisters, daughters, and friends. We are seeing progress in our efforts to bring federal investment to research and innovation for uterine fibroids. Just last week in the U.S. Senate, Senators Cory Booker and Shelley Moore Capito introduced its version of the Stephanie jo- excuse me, Stephanie Tubbs Jones Uterine Fibroid Research and Education Act. This follows a House introduction of the bill led by Representative Yvette Clark. Care About Fibroids is proud to support this legislation that has bipartisan support. Earlier this summer, Care About Fibroids released an important white paper on the financial burden caused by fibroids, and you can get access to this this, uh, paper through the Care About Fibroids website. In our report, we document the loss of productivity that costs the U.S. economy $34 billion, that's B billion, every year, plus the additional costs associated with surgery, pregnancy complications, lots of feminine hygiene products, and more. Together with the bold leadership from leaders like you, Council President Hucker, we are moving the public discussion about fibroids to the forefront of women's health issues. We look forward to working together to create a heightened sense of urgency around fibroids, painful, physical, mental, and financial burdens, and spur innovation and investment that will make a difference in the lives of women who are living with this condition. On behalf of Care About Fibroids, thank you for your dedication to this issue and for being a champion for women's health. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Okay, without further ado, we'll read the proclamation. Proclamation about the Montgomery County Council, whereas fibroids are benign tumors that grow in the uterus of women of childbearing age. They affect 20 to 80% of women by the time they reach age 50, and can lead to serious health consequences and? Whereas fibroids disproportionately affect African-American women compared to white, Hispanic, or Asian women, the cost of fibroids is unknown. However, researchers believe hormones and genetics play a large factor and? Whereas while most fibroids do not cause symptoms, some symptoms include abdominal pain, heavy bleeding, enlargement of the lower abdomen, frequent urination, complications with pregnancy, reproductive problems, and more, and? Whereas fibroids typically resolve after menopause, but it is a leading reason for hysterectomy, surgery removal of the uterus in the United States when they cause severe symptoms, and? Whereas uterine fibroids have had many hidden impacts, including economic, reproductive, and psychological, and? Whereas we commit to working to ensure that healthcare professionals are where equipped and patients get the most up-to-date and accurate information regarding treatment options. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes Fibroid Awareness Month, presented on this 27th day of July in the year 2021, signed by Council Member Navarro and myself. Dr. Lee, thank you so much. Please stay in touch with us. Thank you, Dr. Thanks for all your good work. All right, we're right on time and on to general business. The clerk has distributed the minutes to council members for the meeting of May 12th, 13th, 14th, 17th, and 18th, 2021, and the bi-county meeting minutes of May 13th, 2021. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. Now we can sit as the Board of Health, Dr. Gales and Dr. 
Excuse me, Mr. President, there's okay. one announcement. Please. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, now I have to find it. The public hearing on the spending affordability guidelines for the FY23 capital budget and the FY23-28 capital improvements program will be held on September 21st, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, now we can sit as the Board of Health. Uh, we're looking forward to our briefing, Dr. Gales, and I think Dr. Stoddard is joining us as well. Are we ready to begin? Dr. Gales? Good morning, yep. everyone. I'm ready to begin. Good morning. You all are. Floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, and thank you all for the opportunity to be with you all. Um, if I am allowed, I do have some slides to share with you all uh, to give you some updates, uh, both in terms of our case numbers as well as our vaccine rates. All right. So the marker you're looking at now, there should be, okay, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and we're looking at our new cases. Uh, we've spent the last few briefings uh, talking mainly, or at least the last several months, talking about vaccine rates um, due to the improvements in our community transmission levels. Um, however, as I've referenced in the daily case reports that I send to you all, we are concerned about the upward trends of our numbers of new cases. Uh, and so I wanted to break down some of those numbers for you all by race, uh, zip code, as well as by age, hospitalization, as well as comment on uh, the number of breakthrough cases we've seen in those who've been fully vaccinated. So I'll walk through this, this uh, Excel spreadsheet and then and pivot over to talk about our vaccine numbers. So this actually shows you the, the number of new cases uh, in the last month. Uh, the last month up until the 25th, we've had 608 new total cases. And you can see how it breaks down in terms of the raw number of cases each week, as well as the percentage of cases. This particular uh, section of the spreadsheet shows uh, it broken down by race and ethnicity. And when we look at the total for the last month, 26% uh, of our new cases are non-Hispanic white, 17% non-Hispanic black, 2.5% uh, non-Hispanic Asian, and 15.6% 15 15 Hispanic, um, other 14, and then we still have about 24% uh, missing data on that. When we look at zip code, here's, here are the number of new cases broken down by uh, the zip codes within the county respectively. We see, looking at the total at the bottom, highest percentage, I believe it by zip code, 6.6%, uh, which is the highest percent of new cases. Um, highest percentage of new cases within a zip code in the 20904. Uh, it looks like the next one is 5.6% in 20902. And there are a couple that are at 4%, 20878 and 20906. When we break this down, and again, I will send this to you all uh, following the presentation. When we break this down, new cases by age, when we look at the total here at the bottom, uh, you can see 11% of the cases are zero to nine, and this is important because this group is not eligible to be vaccinated, uh, 10 to 19, 12%. But we start to see the higher percentage of new cases within our 20 to 40 year old populations, 20%, 20 to 29 years of age, and 15.8% those are 30 to 39. And this is concerning because obviously these individuals are eligible to be vaccinated, uh, and yet we're continuing to see a higher percentage of, of, of that group being our new cases. When we look at the hospital uh, hospitalizations for the confirmed cases during this time period, as I told you, 608 new cases in the last month. Uh, 32 of those individuals have been hospitalized, which is just shy of 6% of new cases. And here's how it breaks down by race and ethnicity for those hospitalized cases. And again, a similar uh, measure that looks at the hospitalizations by zip code and hospitalizations by age. We know that, as we've seen throughout the pandemic, uh, older populations have been more susceptible to having adverse reactions. Um, 
and, and complicated courses. And this plays out when we look at um, the of those 32 cases, 10 of those or 30% have been 60 to 60. 69 years of age and another 9 percent those 70 to 79 but what's important to point out is that we also see 15 percent uh, for 20 to 29 year olds and 15 percent for 30 to 39 year olds which suggests again that this is not something completely innocuous if younger people do contract COVID they just as we see in other groups are susceptible, particularly with the variants of having complicated courses and requiring hospitalizations. Now, the last thing I wanted to point out in terms of new cases is the question of breakthrough vaccines. Um, I'm sorry, breakthrough cases in the individuals who've been vaccinated. And we looked at the 608 cases in the last month, uh, and we were able to get vaccination data for uh, about 32% of those individuals. Uh, and we found in that population that we had approximately uh, 144 individuals who had received uh, two doses of the vaccine of those 608 who had cases, which is about 23%. Uh, and 139 of those had uh, been outside of the 14 day window. Um, and another four had uh, not received their second, or I'm sorry, had not uh, completed that two week window um, after receiving the second dose. Now, this is important to point out because there's two ways you can put numbers up. And I know the governor's office tweeted uh, something last week to talk about the number of breakthrough cases. So we're looking at uh, 144 individuals out of the nearly 800,000 folks we fully vaccinated in our county. So who, so when you do the math, you take 144 divided by the 800,000 folks who've been fully vaccinated um, versus when you just look simply at the number of new cases, what percentage of those who have been fully vaccinated. It's important to note and to continue to emphasize is that vaccination provides protection. If there is a small risk that you could still contract COVID, but individuals who are fully vaccinated are not showing up in the hospitals, they're not our fatalities, they're not experiencing symptoms, and they're not experiencing significant illness. Conversely, when we look at the unvaccinated population, they are overwhelmingly all of our hospitalizations and overwhelmingly, I believe in the month of June, 100% of the COVID related fatalities. I just wanna make sure that folks understand the difference between those different groups. Now, I would like to pivot to share one other set of data here. When we talk about our vaccine rates, just quickly, this is just a, 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 a map to show the case rates by county. Um, as you know, we were well below one for the last month, and that number has creeped up to, I think today it was actually 4.5. Um, and you can see how the numbers are increasing across the state. And then this shows you uh, the daily percentage of those not 70% uh, cases the, the percent of new cases who are not fully vaccinated. And so we're still seeing almost 80% of our new cases um, across the state not fully vaccinated. And then when we look at our measures in terms of the percentage of folks we've covered, we again continue to lead the nation in terms of percentage of our population vaccinated who's eligible. The CDC estimate actually has us um, over 77% of the total population having received at least one dose and 70% um, having received uh, both doses. And again, this is for the entire population. When you look at those who are eligible being those who are 12 and over, over the age of 12, we're well over 80%. And this again shows uh, some continued uh, focus in areas where we see some gaps in vaccine by geography and race and ethnicity. And then this is a map that shows you how different um, counties across the country in terms of the percentage of their residents vaccinated 
Um, and you can see we are, um, the red areas highlight areas where there are significant gaps in terms of the percentage of folks um, who are vaccinated um, in much lower percentages. And it unfortunately also correlates very closely to where we're seeing significant upticks of new cases uh, as the Delta variant becomes the, or continues to be the predominant strain um, impacting our communities. So those are some things I just wanted to put out there in terms of our community transmission levels, as well as our vaccine status. Um, as again, we have talked about and I've shared with you all in our daily case counts, it is concerning from the public health perspective that we are continuing to see the upward trends in our numbers of new cases um, as the vaccine rate has slowed down. Um, We've talked about the need uh, to at least have contingency plans to discuss what would happen and what would the necessary measures be to consider taking further action. Um, from the public health perspective, we've been clear in support that unvaccinated individuals should continue to wear face coverings. Um, as the, the number of cases increase and community transmission levels increase, we also would be in support of considering other options to mitigate transmission as much as possible. Uh, and we would welcome uh, and encourage a discussion uh, about potential contingency measures related to that, uh, as well as looking at different measures, including community transmission, case rates, hospitalization rates, as well as factoring in the percentage of our residents who have been fully vaccinated to provide additional protection. This is of increasing importance as we continue to open up society at full capacity, and we continue to move forward and hopefully get all of our uh, students back into schools within the next several weeks. Um, I know that the Board of Education will be meeting this afternoon to discuss what actions they will take in terms of their requirements, uh, particularly related to face coverings and other issues as they move forward to before their policy uh, for school reopening. Uh, I think that concludes my prepared remarks. Happy to answer any questions. We continue to be encouraged by our residents in terms of them taking actions to keep themselves and their family safe. For any individuals who are not vaccinated, we continue to encourage and implore you to get vaccinated to not only protect yourself, but to protect your family and allow us as a community to drive down community transmission as much as possible so that we can excuse me, safely move forward in reopening all aspects of our society. The last thing I would say is, again, as always, it's summertime. Please continue to practice safe practices in terms of the activities that you are, are participating in. Uh, make sure that you stay hydrated with the extreme heat uh, and temperatures that we're experiencing and continue to check on your relatives and other family members or community members, um, particularly older folk uh, within the heat to make sure that they have the necessary provisions to stay safe and are connected. Thank you. Dr. Stoddard, congrats on your new job. Thank you. I appreciate Pleasure. it. Um, um, and just a couple of additional comments to what Dr. Gale said, and I, I think just to largely um, uh, reflect that I absolutely agree with his assessment that obviously we need to be monitoring very closely our conditions. Um, and I think uh, one thing that we are paying a lot of attention to is we have seen a decoupling to a degree of cases from hospitalizations across the country uh, with vaccination rates and our vaccination rate in Montgomery County is among the best. And so obviously, you know, um, we, you know, we can't ignore case counts as they keep going up. Uh, but obviously, we also are paying a lot of attention to the hospitalization rate. And if we start to see an uptick there, I think is, you know, where we're going to really start to raise the alarm bells just for the council's benefit as the Board of Health uh, around, um, you know, having to take some additional further actions. Uh, if, you know, if cases continue to go up at this rate, then we may need to consider those things. If hospitalizations go up as cases go up, you know, we know, case, you know, hospitalization lags cases. And so it's something we need to pay attention to. Um, so I guess the, the summary of that is we can't let cases go up forever, even if hospitalizations don't go up. But if hospitalizations and cases go up, that's the that's a real alarm bell that you all should pay a lot of attention to. And I think we've discussed having some potential benchmarks where um, we, we would request that the Board of Health return and discuss uh, potential additional actions. 
Uh, and I think we'll, you know, we'll, I think Dr. Gales was working on those and I'm sure we'll be able to share those as we, as we move forward. But um, obviously, um, we're incredibly enthusiastic about the levels of vaccination we've achieved. Um, we have seen many calls, though, from the unvaccinated. I've seen several, you know, certainly on social media and others commenting about uh, their, you know, people who are who are hesitant now have seen what Delta can do and are, you know, those people are coming forward and getting vaccinated, which is great. I encourage anyone who has not been vaccinated in Montgomery County to please do so. You getting vaccinated now gives us the best chance to have a successful school year, to not see the case rates increase that we, you know, that we see across the country. And all of that. So that's all I have this morning. I, I will note, um, at least on the rental relief program, we did make the $2 million uh, for a single week mark last week. That was a target that we had set for ourselves. You know, as you'll remember, several weeks ago, we were only doing about a million a week. We got the 2 million last week, which is a great increase. We're to try and work to do more and faster. But I wanted to provide that one update because I know that the council has been very interested in the rental relief program as well. So I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Spatter. And I should I should clarify that we're so glad you're staying in county government and been nominated to be an assistant county administrative officer. Uh, so we're very eager to uh, continue your good work uh, with us. Um, just one quick follow-up question I had. Uh, Dr. Gales, um, I'm glad to hear that you, you uh, mentioned that you're open to other measures beyond masking um, to mitigate the risk that's posed by unvaccinated residents and, and visitors. Um, in your view, should individuals over 12 who have refused to get vaccinated at this point lose any privileges at some point, um, such as the ability to enter indoor public spaces, particularly county facilities? Um, should we be asking residents to show their vaccination card or use a passport system like um, other jurisdictions have thought about? I can't comment on that in terms of, you know, I don't make those policies, but what I would say is from a, you know, I would provide guidance to you all and to others uh, in terms of the value, potential value of those steps. I think that there are a host of measures um, in terms of, of potential things in the toolbox, including one, one measure would be looking at, you know, uh, other jurisdictions who have taken a step to re-implement mask mandates, particularly in indoor settings, regardless of vaccine status. Uh, you have seen other places, I believe the, the president of France introduced the idea and notion that you referenced about uh, proof of vaccination uh, in terms of in order to participate in daily activities, going to restaurants, working out, going to schools, going to different activities, um, having to show some level of proof of, of vaccination. Uh, uh, the challenge would be obviously is creating a system particularly in the absence of a federal and a state system that allows for that is creating a mechanism for uh, for that to happen. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, from my understanding, at least from a legal perspective, businesses retain the right to be able to do that now. Um, if they do request um, individuals to demonstrate and show vaccine status in order to be able to uh, enjoy the privileges of the services that they provide. All right, good point. Thank you. Council Member Raymond. Thank you so much. Uh, Tough day with the memorial for our, our county employees today and just the anxiety out there about the uh, you know, increase of cases related to the Delta variant. Um, and, uh, you know, it's tough to, that we're continuing these challenging conversations, but we knew, we knew that this was not going to go away anytime soon. And the pandemic, in fact, is certain to be with us for a long time. So um, this is the new normal. But um, I am absolutely encouraged by the news that there are no hospitalizations among vaccinated residents. Um, and given the very high level of vaccination for our 12 and up population, I think generally that, as I think Dr. Stoddard was kind of explaining and Dr. Gales, that you know, if there's no hospitalizations among vaccinated residents, then the threat that we're facing, broadly speaking, is, is a contained threat. Um, and it requires targeted measures uh, to address. And um, I think we need to do more with our targeted measures for the Delta variant, but at the same time, recognizing that unless something changes, 
vaccinated residents don't end up in the hospital. Almost almost everybody above certain age range is, is vaccinated. And and so the, the, the ultimate health impact of this, uh, you know, we still have a very effective tool in vaccinations and the risk is fairly low for those who are not vaccinated. It's those special circumstances if you have, for example, a someone in your household who cannot get vaccinated uh, and you are vaccinated, of course, it's a big risk if uh, you were to contract it, you're not at risk yourself, but you could transmit it to someone in your household, for example. So it's important for us to continue to contain this, but um, I, I continue to um, raise, wave the flag for, for incentives. And I know it didn't make it into this round of uh, enhanced COVID emergency measures, um, but I, I have asked council staff to draft an appropriation um, for September. I think we've got to get, you know, get deeper into these target zip codes and into targeted communities where there's access issues or, or hesitancy issues and incentives are, are proven to work. Um, and we need to, of course, continue to deepen our door-to-door -door and, and other kinds of grassroots uh, activism to reach people. Um, as far as masking is concerned, I will say I see a very high level of voluntary masking uh, in the county. Um, and I, I admit I haven't been inside a grocery store in every neighborhood of the county, but um, generally what I'm seeing is is a very high level of voluntary masking. So, um, you know, whatever that's based on, I, I, I believe the science that if you aren't vaccinated, you, if you are vaccinated, you don't need to mask. But uh, obviously, if everyone does choose to mask, I think we're safer. So um, I see that working well. But uh, I think the a big open question is is kids and schools and masking, which seems to me will need to be required. Um, you know, vaccine mandates for kids when that's when that's legal. Um, you know, from the state, I understand the state has to require that. Um, and county employees, <clears throat> you know, I'd very much like to see a mandate for county employees. That is an emergency, uh, an emerging best practice. And um, you know, the Veterans Administration has just put that in place. I think we'll see more governmental organizations, uh, you know, achieving that. We we don't know enough, of, I guess, about our county employee vaccination rate, um, but I think uh, a, a mandate. You know, as a term of employment, or uh, you know, I'm not sure what the what the consequences need to be. Uh, I have to figure that out. But it just seems like, um, you know, from our perspective, we would want it to be a required, and we would not want to have tolerance for people who are refusing to be vaccinated for any reason other than a than a doctor, you know, doctor ordered health reason. Um, so. Uh, and I think there's a big open question about why should people who are willing to get vaccinated have to pay for the expenses of people who are refusing to get vaccinated when they go into the hospital. You know, this is a national trend, frankly. Um, but uh, generally speaking, um, again, Dr. Gales, thank you for the information you shared about no known hospitalizations for people who have been vaccinated. I think that's a critical piece of data for us to keep uh, front and center. Thank you. If, if I could add uh, uh, to Council Member Rimmer's remarks to clarify, I did get, get confirmation that businesses can require proof of vaccination for entry of their services. Uh, the second component is, is that, yes, we are obviously continue to be excited and want to move forward getting higher percentages of our residents vaccinated. But we're still talking about several hundred thousand people who aren't covered. Uh, and that's potential for uh, several hundred thousand uh, individuals being susceptible uh, to uh, to COVID uh, that could potentially contribute to hospitalizations in the future. The other component that I want to highlight is that we it's important to continue to drive community transmission levels down because driving community transmission levels down also decreases the potential for interruptions to services. So for example, if a person comes, you know, test positive for COVID, if individuals have been around that individual without 
uh, you know, face coverings and other mitigating circumstances, that re that increases the number of folks to potentially have to quarantine again and to have to stop that particular service for a time period. This is at, takes on added significance as well as is um, in terms of school guidance related to spacing and, and and wearing face coverings. So I just want people to also understand is that one we're trying to drive community transmission down as low as possible again to keep from having to interrupt businesses and interrupt services. No one, none of us, none of us call, certainly none of us in public health want to have to get to a point where we'd have to recommend closures or things like that. We're just making sure that folks are mindful that we have to pay attention to the trends and look at some of our other toolkit tools that we have in the toolkit, again, to drive the number down as much as possible so that we don't have to see any of those other uh, more stringent options be put forward as guidance uh, to keep us safe. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you. Thanks for the update. I, I think that we've really started to hone in on, you know, zip codes and uh, age and, and, and specifically looking at these uh, numbers. It's, it's really helpful for us and, and really appreciate uh, these uh, regular updates here at this meeting and also your, your emails uh, to us and uh, really appreciate that. I want to talk quickly about um, some of the Suggestions that you've made and also uh, pick up uh, where Councilman Reamer was uh, noting, uh, not only France, but New York City um, uh, recently announced the uh, percentages of their own employees, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, uh, who uh, are vaccinated. I was just wondering if we have that type of data or whether or not that is uh, something that we are looking into and pursuing as a county government, looking at our first responders and county employees as a whole and determining uh, what our vaccination rates are of our own employees, because you know, we are an employer, a very large uh, employer, and I think we can lead by the power of our example, uh, not just the example of our power. We, we have not uh, engaged with our employees to try and assess uh, vaccination rates across the entire government. I will note, though, that uh, because we were the primary vaccinator during the time when public safety was being vaccinated, we were able to track public safety vaccinations much closely, more closely. And candidly, our numbers are substantially higher than those in New York City for our first responders. And I think that's probably exemplary of where our employee base is generally, given um, what we know the vaccination rates in Montgomery County are overall. Uh, that said, uh, we certainly are following very closely both the, um, well, the changes that have been made in New York City and California to require employees to be vaccinated. Um, the county executive has expressed an interest in having this conversation with our employee groups to see exactly what, you know, how, how to roll that kind of program out. And I, I do expect that conversation will happen, you know, particularly now as we're seeing more jurisdictions do it. So I, I don't think there's any opposition to that uh, notionally. It's, so I'll be obviously finding an accord, and particularly as it relates to, as Council Member Reamer uh, Refer to figuring out the consequence or what the what the right uh, uh, you know agreed upon discipline process would be for someone or, or accommodation or what what have you. I don't want to I don't want to forestall that it would be discipline necessarily. Uh, and then what exemptions would would be appropriate? Medical exemptions obviously would be considered, but you know obviously we want to discuss with the employee groups exactly you know how this kind of process would work. I just was reiterating that I think from the from the policy perspective, I think there is real interest in in working out the details of something like this, and I think that conversations around this will will proceed. Well, appreciate that. I strongly urge that we move in that direction. I think you know, we talk a lot about our residents leading the country and eligible uh, being vaccinated in that percentage of large jurisdictions. Uh, you know, I think it's important that we demonstrate that our county government uh, is a leader in the nation uh, when it comes to stepping up and uh, doing what is needed to keep each other safe. So I, I think uh, moving in that direction and, and uh, requiring that working with partners to, to make that happen and to operationalize that would be a positive step in the right direction. And I think uh, you know, sooner rather than later, uh, getting that data and, and publishing that for ourselves to hold each other accountable and then also uh, for the public to know. I think that's uh, that's really important. I'm uh, confident that we will be doing better than most, but that there is still more work that can be done uh, in, in that regard. And so I, I think it would help uh, to, to hold us accountable. And, you know, I, my, my understanding, the Department of Justice, not only for businesses, 
uh, you know, but also for agencies, including, uh, you know, local governments that, you know, requirements for, uh, for vaccinations, there's no federal laws uh, that are preventing that. That was an open question for quite a bit of time uh, based on the uh, authorization, and that doesn't seem to be uh, an issue now. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. But the last thing that I will say is, that, you know, I, I do think, you know, continuing to monitor this is important and figuring out where we head. I am a little bit concerned uh, that we not uh, punish uh, or place the, impose restrictions on those who have been vaccinated, uh, that we try to, uh, you know, uh, target uh, additional, uh, 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 you know, restrictions or, or, or changes uh, on those who haven't been vaccinated in order to try to continue to move uh, as many folks as possible to be vaccinated. I think that was the direction that we headed uh, with our uh, final uh, health orders uh, with your uh, significant uh, advice and, and input. And I hope that we continue uh, with that uh, trend and, and, and with that effort. So thanks for all your efforts and your continued work. Look forward to continuing the conversation and uh, very eager to see the results of the conversations with the labor partners, particularly about, uh, you know, what those percentages are and how we're going to move them in an even more positive direction. Thanks. Thank you. Council Vice President Albernoz. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you again, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, the whole team. Uh, the fact that we lead the country in this really critically important category is just a testament once again uh, to everybody's dedication and hard work and, frankly, innovation. Um, so it, it is, um, uh, and, and all the folks that are going to Home Depots right now, to, um, you know, creative places, supermarkets, uh, where, where, you know, vaccinations are being stood up, uh, wherever folks are, is, is, I think, a testament to the folks that are out there, uh, particularly our minority health initiatives and program that are doing such incredible work. So um, this, is, this is all uh, overall uh, good news uh, here here in Montgomery County. Um, I wanted to just summarize really quick, Dr. Gales, just, just to make sure I understood kind of where we are in your recommendations for, for myself. Um, so bottom line is at the moment, um, community spread continues to be low, especially relative to the rest of the country. Hospitalization rates uh, continue to be low, um, especially as it relates to the rest of the country. So at this point, you're not formally recommending that we enact um, policies uh, such as uh, mask use at this specific time um, with the acknowledgement that uh, we, we have to continue to monitor these numbers uh, and at such time, um, you know, re-implement, for example, the mask mandate indoors. I just want to be crystal clear on uh, where, where we are with this um, so that we can prepare accordingly and for our public at home, although we are going on recess after this week, as has always been the case, uh, we stand ready to uh, uh, convene as necessary uh, to implement policy sitting as the Board of Health. But I think that's what you said, but I just wanted to be sure about that. Right. Thank you, Council Member Albernos, for your question. So let, let me be clear so there's no confusion. From a health perspective, what we're requesting or asking is that there be a plan put into place that comes up with metrics and measures that would would trigger potential action to, you know, to take next steps. Um, and that includes, you know, having a conversation about what those metrics would be. Um, similar to back in the fall when we talked about looking at metrics for potential closure of activities if we saw an increase in cases, as well as what types of measures would be put into place to trigger reopening things such as we put into place back in May related, or April related to vaccine numbers. Uh, my attempt to put forward this guidance is to ring an alarm, to sound an alarm, to say the numbers that while they are on the lower end are not moving in the right direction. Now, again, we are in a different place where we were in the fall, uh, given that we have a high percentage of our residents vaccinated. We still have several hundred thousand folks who are not covered within that, um, including our children. Uh, and it takes added importance in terms of having contingency plans in place because we know that within the next several weeks, our kids will be back in school. 
Um, businesses will continue to reopen again at fuller capacities, uh, bringing folks back into offices. So we want to make sure that we're mindful of those types of activities because, again, we want things to move forward, but we want them to move forward safely. And so what we're asking is that given that the numbers are moving in, uh, they are increasing, you know, certainly they have increased over the last several weeks, is this is an effort to, to ring the alarm and sound the alarm to make sure that we have done our due diligence in having those discussions to have contingency plans in place so that we're not having the discussion, you know, God forbid, that we do see those hospitalizations increase, you know, in, in that setting because we know that historically putting in those measures before the numbers get worse do have an effect in terms of, of mitigating it. And I, I want to just also be careful about how we couch this um, in terms of, you know, if if there was a recommendation or a movement to re-implement a, a face covering mandate, you know, I, I, I don't, at least from the health perspective, don't want to use terms in terms of, you know, punishing those versus, you know, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, because at the end of the day, we want to, these are efforts to keep people safe. And so I, I, I strongly implore um, folks who are not vaccinated to get vaccinated because uh, vaccines are our most effective tool in the toolbox because we know they work and they keep people from getting sick. Um, and the higher percentage of those folks we can get covered, the less we have to be concerned about putting in these other mitigating factors or other mitigating tools to keep people uh, safe. So I hope that answers your question. It, it does. So I think if, if I'm hearing you correctly, we should probably reinstitute um, the meetings that had occurred uh, more regularly between council and executive staff, um, just so that we're, we're not flat footed uh, as we continue to monitor the numbers. And fortunately, there's a game plan. I mean, we've, we've been through this several times now in terms of waves. So we, we know what those benchmarks are generally. They're not perfect, but generally. So um, I think we can, we'll, we'll revisit those as necessary and hopefully between now and when we come back in September, we won't have to, um, but we, as, as you said, it would be prudent for us to be prepared just in case. Um, so I, I will follow up with you, Mr. Council President, so we can um, um, recommend and, and make sure that my colleagues all have the opportunity uh, to weigh in on these discussions as, as we get weekly updates. Um, Two final questions for now. Um, it's just absolutely infuriating uh, that there are certain states in this country that um, for political reasons primarily just refuse, refuse uh, to, to follow the most common sense aspects of the science, uh, Florida being one of those states. And as we know, uh, it's a popular destination for vacationers. There are a number of county residents that own properties in Florida. Um, could you advise us a little bit given the circumstances that we're seeing in Florida is the state looking at or exploring recommending that people coming from these states, as we've done in the past, that have higher rates of spread quarantine when they come back? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if the state is planning to take action on that. Um, I have not received any intel or, or had that be a part of any recent conversations that I've been a part of. Um, but that does introduce, again, another tool in the toolkit that we could potentially explore as a county um, in terms of um, identify much like uh, back in uh, probably about a year ago where there were travel restrictions put into place based upon certain jurisdictions that had um, high levels of cases. Uh, and so again, that's I, 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 those are parts of, of the conversation, again, in terms of having contingency plans to keep our, our, our residents safe. And that would be one option to explore uh, in terms of potential testing requirements tied to uh, some of those higher volume places. Because you're, it, it is extremely concerning um, that a place such as Florida, high population, lower vaccine rates, uh, where the variants can spread very quickly, uh, and then individuals traveling to those places could bring those home. So what I would say is similar to what we talked about last year is that individuals be mindful of the places where they're going um, in terms of looking at what the community transmission levels are. If and when you do travel to those places, particularly given that have high levels, 
is continuing to double down on the, you know, the, the guidance that we've shared in terms of wearing face coverings and washing your hands and cleaning surfaces and those types of things and being very mindful about, you know, your level of exposure to others, particularly related to physical distancing and those types of principles. And quite frankly, um, would recommend individuals getting tested uh, when they return home to know what their status is to make sure that they've not picked up um, COVID and brought it back to uh, their homes and their schools and their businesses as they return um, after their vacations or time away. And Council Vice President uh, Alvinos, just to add to Dr. Gales, uh, he, he indicated and has reemphasized not only vaccination but testing. We have testing available. So all who are viewing the council uh, sitting as the Board of Health, we have testing available Monday through Sunday from 9 o'clock to 6 p.m. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, our mobile vaccination team with support from the state um, it is testing at our um, uh, the American grocery store in Piney Branch from 1 to 7. We have testing available, and we still continue to, upon request, have home-based testing. Individuals can call 240-777-2982 as a reminder. And I wanted to share that information again because as individuals travel through the summer to those areas, Dr. Gales indicated on that map that have had higher rates of uh, uh, community transmission. We strongly recommend and encourage you to get tested, know your status, and if necessary, um, uh, quarantine or isolate accordingly. Thank you. I think Dr. Starter, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to just chime in, to, in, in in concert with what we've just heard. Last week, 40% of the cases across the country were in three states. Florida, Texas, Missouri. So if you're traveling to one of those three states particularly, but not exclusively, you absolutely should be considering testing uh, upon return and uh, masking while you're there, you know, limiting your, you know, times, you know. I, I certainly wouldn't do, for example, indoor dining in one of those three states right now. Uh, if I, you know, if I were, particularly if you have children that you're traveling with, often parents are traveling with uh, children at this time, so. Um, just be smart about where you select to travel. If you travel to those places, be smart when you get there and be smart, particularly when you get back for the benefit of everyone in Montgomery County. Well, wow, that's powerful and important message. Final uh, question. So um, obviously we're all hoping that the vaccine becomes available to children under the age of 12 as soon as possible. And none of us have a, uh, can predict exactly when that's going to happen. Um, but Dr. Gales, just to reaffirm, you've talked about this in the past, but particularly for families who are the moment it's available are going to want to get their kids vaccinated. Um, I assume and just want to confirm the infrastructure is still in place for us to churn that out quickly. Um, and, and that uh, although we've closed some mass vaccination sites, we still have all that we need to be able to implement something and turn it around and, and you know, within a reasonable amount of time, get, get vaccinations in kids' arms. Sure. So yes, the infrastructure remains in place, but hopefully also in addition to the, the mass vax infrastructure is there have been significant conversations at the state level uh, to talk about improvements in terms of getting the vaccine available to private providers as well, making it more readily accessible to community providers. One of the blips that was experienced uh, when we had the 12 to 18 year olds become eligible was that there were some issues with getting the vaccine from the federal level to providers directly. And hopefully those um, challenges in the system have been ironed out. Um, I know that we had our uh, uh, the state immunization committee meeting, which I chair uh, last week, and we talked through those particular issues and, and have brought that to the attention of MDH. So the short answer is yes, we do retain that infrastructure, but we are also hopeful that it will the vaccine will be more readily available to community providers to offer some diversity and increased points of, of access for families. Great, thank you. I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Jawanda. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President, and um, thank you, as always, Dr. Gales, Dr. Stoddard, um, Dr. Bridges, and your entire teams for all the work you're doing. Um, also, want to just send uh, my heartfelt condolences to the families of all the those that we've lost, but especially uh, in this moment, this morning, uh, our brave men and women who've 
past due to this pandemic during uh, the last several months. Uh, it's really a stark reminder of how serious this is. A uh, couple of questions as follow up. Uh, I appreciate the, my colleagues' questions up to this point. Um, when you say metrics or measures, Dr. Gales, do you have suggestions, right? You know, because I think, you know, even though we're the Board of Health, we have appropriately uh, leaned on your guidance and your team's guidance to set what we think those metrics and measures should be. Have you all gotten to the point where you're looking at what that might be? Because they're going to be different, right? You've said we have a lot of people vaccinated, so the measures you know, likely need to be a little different, or, or maybe they don't. I, I, that's kind of a question. What would be, uh, in your mind, have you started to formulate that? And vis-a-vis -vis a place like Los Angeles or something, it's kind of a secondary question. How are we looking to what others have? I know they're a different situation, but they obviously set, made their decision based on some set of, of data. So could you just provide a little more insight into that? Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Uh, so the first answer is yes, we are continuing to look at what other jurisdictions are doing, uh, not only across the nation, but we've been engaged in conversation with health officers across the, the DMV region as well as the state to talk about what other places are doing. Um, and it seems to be kind of a consensus that recognizing the trends, folks are, you know, looking at contingency plans, uh, and in particular, you know, you know, focused interventions versus, you know, kind of broader population interventions. Um, and some of the measures that would be, you know, looked at in, in consideration are, you know, the, the ones we've, we've looked at historically, community transmission as evidenced by case rates, um, and, and looking at not only the raw numbers, but also the change. So, for example, when we look at our you know, daily cases reported, we've seen a 75% increase over the last week in terms of cases reported on a daily basis. So looking at the raw numbers, looking at the percentage of change, um, also again, looking at the hospitalization numbers, because that gives us also a sense of the severity of illness that folks are experiencing. And so, you know, looking at the percentage of, of beds in use, as well as the percentage of those beds being occupied by COVID patients. And so we would look at that raw number again, percentage, but we'd also be keen to look at um, and try to identify an upward trend as quickly as possible. So looking at, you know, if there's a significant percentage increase in the number of people hospitalized, as well as, you know, hospitalized related to COVID, that would sound an alarm because this was pointed out earlier and we've seen historically throughout the pandemic, the hospitalizations typically lag um, at least a week or so, the, the, the increase in, in, in normal, the increase in raw cases and the hospitalizations typically lag and, and, and trail behind that. And, you know, we try to, to offset and cut this off as quickly as we can um, so that we don't see that number building. Great. All right. Well, I know we'll follow up with you as Councilmember Alvernaz suggested more, more regularly to track those numbers. But if you could, you know, you don't have to do it right this moment. But I think we, we should have you suggest to us what those trigger points should be um, and what they should trigger, right? You know, for example, you know, I, I was at a large gathering event yesterday indoors. I still, I'm vaccinated months now. I still wear my face covering indoors at large events where I have mixed, where I don't know people's vaccination status. You know, I have four children under 12, uh, you know, as does Council Member Albernaz and, 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 and others and, you know, and I have seniors and, you know, so we have, for my situation, and that is, for example, something that I think I'm seeing more of, people do voluntarily, but I do think that uh, this in public place, places masking is, is obviously on the table. It could be tied to large gatherings. I, I think, you know, those are, I'm assuming those are some of the things you would look at as far as like triggers to again balance, uh, you know, allowing people to move freely, but balancing the health risk. Am, am I on the right track there? Yes. Okay. So uh, as I just want to be clear, you know, we're we're trying to think of different strategies to, you know, 
to use a medical example, using a, a surgical knife as opposed to a broad hammer a scalpel. Um, as much as possible to, um, yeah, but the scalpel to those who know what a scalpel is, but, you know, surgical knife approach um, in terms of being able to, you know, think through some strategies that still allow us to maximize opening up as much as possible and being able to enjoy those different activities, but still have some safety parameters in place to mitigate transmission. Well, I appreciate that. And I think that's the right approach. I hope our schools, I think they should absolutely, you know, my kids will be masked when they, they are masked now during the summer and summer school. I think will, I think the school board will move in that direction, but I think they're unvaccinated individuals. So it's uh, an, an important. Uh, appreciate uh, the previous questions about our staff. I, I hope you'll follow, I know you guys will follow up on that. I had questions there too. And then uh, the last thing I'd ask about is the breakthrough cases again. So if I was reading that right, there were a uh, hundred and some odd of the 600, 130, I don't want to misquote it, were breakthrough cases, were cases where people were vaccinated 14 days or more and got and contracted COVID. Is that correct? Did I read that right? Okay. And are we still doing, uh, the answer was yes, Dr. Gels was on mute, but just for the public, the answer was yes. Uh, the Are we still doing contact tracing? related to that and, mm -hmm. and is that le if so is that leading back to anything specific any set of activities locations you know like we used to see with you know restaurants indoor dining you know we had some trends that formed is are we seeing anything like that uh there's nothing that jumps out at the moment i'll have to go back and take a look at it so yes contact tracing continues uh and it continues utilizing um, our own staff here, as well as working with the state. Uh, and we do, we're actually due to get our weekly report from the state uh, tomorrow morning that will provide insights in terms of you know, particular activities. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, I want to say, you know, it, it, a lot of it stems from, you know, larger gatherings uh, with folks being exposed. Um, and it's a mix of, you know, unvaccinated folks with vaccinated. And to give a sense of, of the scope, we're talking about you know, uh, 600 total new cases in the last month, which, you know, to give perspective, there were days last year and earlier this year, actually, where we saw, you know, four or 500 cases on right. a daily basis. Right. Um, and when we look at that number of the percentage of, you know, so we're talking about 100 some odd folks who have been fully vaccinated on that 600. That's 23 percent. When you scale that out again, you flip the denominator when you look at the percentage of those folks who are vaccinated who are testing positive, that 144 is 0.00001% of the 800,000 folks who've been vaccinated. Um, so I wanna make sure that people yep. understand both sides of that number, because I don't want folks to say, well, even see the vaccinated people still get it. That's why I'm not getting vaccinated. No, <laughs> that's not what we're saying. Vaccinated folks, there's always been you know a small risk of contracting it, but they're not having symptoms. They're not ending up in the hospital. If you are an unvaccinated individual, you still carry extreme risk of developing complications should you come into contact with it. And that's the group that we're significantly worried about that could potentially cause us to see an increase in hospitalizations and continued COVID-related fatalities. Important point. And yeah, oh, go ahead, Dr. Stoddard. I was also gonna add it. Not only, it is also very likely that the unvaccinated people are doing the bulk of the transmitting even to vaccinated people as well. So not only are not only is there not only is there the benefit to yourself, but from a public health perspective, being vaccinated will reduce your probability of being able to transmit, even if you were one of those vaccinated people who did end up contracting. So it's important to understand that this pulp, as a public health issue, not just an individualistic med medical issue, um, vac you know, transmission is being driven by those who are unvaccinated across the country, as it is in Montgomery County. Yeah, do it for yourself, but do it for your community. And I, and an important point, Dr. S Dr. Both of you and Dr. Gales, that unvac unvaccinated people are the people who are getting sick and dying. Vaccinated people are not. Um, and and how small of a percentage that is. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, um, and uh, for all the work you're doing. And it, it's because we rank first in the nation because of the work that you and your teams are doing. So really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I want to thank Dr. Gail Stoddard and Bridgers for 
for all that they do on not just this topic, but many others as well. You know, we've been doing a lot of discussions uh, on other topics as well about marketing. And, and I think that we need to make certain that our marketing continues to be so we can reach, obviously, the people who are not vaccinated. And, and it, are we still, as an example, if someone uh, calls in and says that they would like to to have a, a, the vaccination in their home, someone would, would come to their home and do that. Are we still doing that? Uh, yes. If, if, yeah, if, if there's an individual who has, you know, uh, issues being able to get out uh, with transportation or other issues and need that, please let us know. And, and I think we need to, if we can, make that very prominent on our website, and on other places, if you'll send it to, to each of us, that, that we can put it in their newsletters as well, so that the, the, the people who, it, it might not be that they're um, people that are don't want the vaccination, they just don't know how to get the vaccination in some cases, or don't have the, the uh, ability to get the vaccination. Is, is the, the uh, we were talking about the providers themselves, are the private physicians, do they have the vaccination now? Yes, they do. Yes. They do. So if someone called their private physician, then they could also receive, because there was a time, obviously, that that was an issue as well. And then my final uh, question is, in, in, um, um, when the under 12 uh, uh, children, is there any idea when they might have the the ability to get a vaccination? I mean, I'm assuming that it's ongoing for the the uh, the uh, Pfizer's and the, and the other and and the, uh, the other people who are actually providing the vaccine that they're continuing to do testing. Is there any idea when they might be a, a, allowed to get it? Well, thank you, Councilmember Katz. So I, I wanted to clarify, before getting to that one, I wanted to clarify with the private providers. So again, in order for private providers to get access to the vaccine, it's not something that's just sent to all of them. They actually have to go through and register with the state system to be approved as a vaccine provider, which a lot of them are already, but you know, specifically for COVID, and then they can get vaccines shipped directly to them. So if you have a private provider at home, I would encourage you to call your provider to see if they are offering the vaccine before showing up and, and expecting to get it. And to the point related to children, we don't unfortunately have, um, or at least I'm not aware of an update in terms of the time frame. There had been hope that uh, by mid to late August or early September that the vaccine would become available to the younger folks, but uh, the FDA has not opined recently uh, any updates in terms of when we, we expect to get that. Um, unfortunately, it's probably looking more to mid-fall than earlier fall um, when that will become available to that younger population. Thank you. Thank you uh, for all that you do, and I'm yielding back, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Rice. Thank you very much. So first, I want to thank you, Dr. Gales and Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Kroll. I know you may not be on the line, but for uh, promising to partner with us, just to let my colleagues know, CVS, Aetna, uh, in conjunction with uh, MCPS and the health department is looking to do a vaccination uh, date as well as testing uh, for MCPS's back to school. Uh, which is incredibly important because that back to school fair involves our children, our young people that are going back to the classroom, as well as their parents and families. And so it's a great opportunity while people are out uh, to be able to get both vaccinated as well as tested. And so from that perspective, I uh, just really want to thank CVS Aetna as well as um, uh, you, Dr. Gales, Dr. Bridges, Dr. Kroll, and Montgomery County Public Schools for all coming together uh, on that initiative. I think it's things like that that you, Chair Albernos, Vice President Albernos, we're talking about when it comes to those creative types of partnerships that are going to be incredibly important about ways to continue to move us forward in the community. To that end, Dr. Gales, my question for you is along the lines of our students as well. As we know that this is prime time summer, uh, our July, August timeframe is when many of our families travel. And so similar to last year, 
uh, we actually asked for some guidance that I think then uh, Superintendent Smith gave to uh, parents uh, and families as they were looking to travel across the world, not just uh, throughout the United States. And so what would be the recommendations and suggestions? You've touched on it a bit, but are there places that folks should actually avoid? Um, it's very interesting that the United States has actually highlighted some areas in some countries that actually have less transmission rates than states uh, that are in the United States as travel advisories, which I found very interesting. Many of them Latinx countries, and I'll leave that for a discussion for another day as to why that happens. But I'm certainly uh, curious as to what your thoughts are there just for advice for uh, those families and individuals who will be traveling during this high peak time, where we'll also see probably our uh, travel lines uh, in airports and other travel venues that'll be much longer than they've ever been before. So folks will be experiencing this for the first time in a year and a half. So what should their practices be? Thank you, Councilmember Rice, for your question and observation. Uh, you're right, uh, it's August. You all are going on recess. I hope you take some vacation. And, you know, lots of people will be moving around. Uh, and so I think the first thing is, again, to continue to pay attention to reports of what community transmission levels are in respective places. There's lots of places where you can get that information from the CDC website. Uh, different embassies uh, have that updated information in terms of levels. Uh, the State Department actually lists, uh, they regularly list kind of, you know, warnings related to the safety of particular countries, but they've also, um, as part of that information, also released travel advisories related to COVID transmission. Uh, and that applies to, you know, other countries. Uh, but, you know, the CDC and other venues also continue to put information, make information available for domestic destinations in terms of their levels of transmission. Um, as was referenced by, there is a number of states, uh, in, you know, including Florida, where we're seeing uh, significantly higher numbers that are extremely concerning. So I think the first and most important thing is, is to be mindful of where you're traveling. And if there is an area that has significantly elevated levels of community transmission, particularly in the absence of, uh, of public health measures in place to mitigate those types of things, um, I would be, I would encourage folks to be cautious about traveling to those areas. And if you do, making sure that even in the absence of larger mandates or larger restrictions or requirements, do recommend that you incur, I, that you recommend you to continue to follow those public health guidance around face coverings and other types of things, again, to mitigate the risk of transmission to you and your family, particularly if you're traveling with children under the age of 12 who are not eligible to get the vaccine. So I think those are probably the biggest ones, as well as, as Dr. Bridges pointed out, we have numerous places where individuals can continue to get tested throughout the county. And the recommendation would be if you do travel to any of those places upon return home that you get tested so you know your status and you know your family status to potentially minimize exposing other individuals should you test positive upon return. And Dr. Yales, I've heard that uh, the United States is actually, and so it's good for the millions that are watching at home uh, to understand some of the regulations that are out there. There are certain countries to where the United States actually is mandated that you must have a negative COVID test before you can actually even return into the country. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, about coverage, uh, about how that works? Let's say that a family, you know, doesn't have uh, health care coverage, those kinds of things. How is it paid for? Are they able to do those kinds of things or those things that folks should be prepared for just as they're about to leave? You know, knowing some of this will be incredibly helpful. We hate to hear stories about folks that may be stuck at the border not being able to get back into the country. Sure. So the, the U.S. actually requires, regardless of where you go, regardless of the country, anyone coming back into the country to have a negative COVID test within 72 hours of returning. So this is regardless of where you're going uh, on the globe. Uh, it's required to come back in. Many uh, places, um, 
you know, have, have set up different testing provisions. So a lot of countries um, have uh, private providers that you can access, private labs. Um, I know a number of hotels and resorts in different places have included a testing option or made a testing option readily available to their residents and folks who are staying on their properties. Um, I believe that in many instances they are are paid for out of pocket um, in a range of, of services from being able to go to a pharmacy and getting one for 25 to 35 dollars to getting you know a more private rapid test that may be several hundred dollars um, I also uh, from my understanding uh, believe that a number of airports have, have made testing uh, uh, options available for folks who are flying in and out um, and so what I would encourage folks to do, is if you are traveling out of the country is to do your research and identify places that you can get tests before you leave and to contact those places so that you understand what the costs are. Do um, and, and there's an extensive list of the types of tests which are acceptable upon return and making sure that the tests that are offered in those places match up to what is accept an acceptable uh, return. And the way it works in many instances is as part of you flying back into the country, the airlines have different software that allow you to upload your test results and they will be able to confirm that that it meets the requirements, confirm that it's negative, and allow and, tech, and, and give you some level of preliminary clearance so that you actually can board the plane and, and come back home. Uh, and so, again, do your research before you leave uh, to make sure that you know where to get that done, you know how to pay for it, uh, and in instances where insurance may cover it, that you're able to get that information transferred to minimize the financial burden to you and your family. So, Dr. Gales, thank you very much, because you're not hearing this on uh, media outlets. They're not talking about this, and this is really incredibly important as folks look to travel. So, thank you for giving the guidance uh, for folks, not only when it comes to how to best keep themselves safe, but then also to ensure that um, they are adhering to uh, some of the mandates that are before us. I'll just close with one last thing that some of my colleagues have touched on, and um, look, you know, no one wants to feel as though we're penalizing those who have done the right thing by getting vaccinated, uh, by following many of the guidelines, uh, continuing to minimize the risk. Um, but the reality is this, is that we all have that shared responsibility to keep us all safe. Uh, and so from that perspective, it's oftentimes seen as though the people who are doing the right things are oftentimes the ones who end up uh, sacrificing. Uh, but that's true when it comes to pretty much everything that's out there. Uh, so what do you say and, and what is your message to those who have, you know, done what they're supposed to, they have their entire families who've been vaccinated, but who still struggle with the fact that, you know, there, that there could be at some point another mask mandate that's there that, you know, uh, on the horizon that continues to impact them when they feel as though they've done everything that they should. I'll be perfectly candid. This is a tough one for me to answer in my capacity as a health officer, but also my capacity as a private citizen. Um, you know, th this is tough. We're, we have created, so I'll, 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 as the health officer sitting in the Board of Health, I'll answer it from the health officer perspective. We have been fortunate to have a tool that's effective at keeping people safe, that allows us to be able to move forward and reopen society and return to schools, return to business, return to work, return to all of those things. And it has unfortunately become very politicized in terms of an issue of civil and personal and individual liberties and the influence of government, uh, which is extremely unfortunate. And it has caused a situation where there is this huge deluge, if you will, of misinformation We've even had the Surgeon General, the U.S. Surgeon General, come out and talk about how dangerous misinformation is because that misinformation has led people to make uninformed choices um, that have put their lives and others at risk. You know, I think in last week's session, we talked about, uh, Dr. Stoddard mentioned the case of the physician in Alabama who shared stories of folks who uh, were anti-vaccine or, or against it or believe that COVID was a hoax, 
who were in the hospital and about to be ventilated asking and requesting for the vaccine and then being too late at that point. Um, and we've seen numerous, you know, news outlets go back and forth in terms of the information they put out. This has to stop because this is, you know, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate that we are in a place where health information and science have been politicized and uses a political football. Um, and it's, it's put people's lives at risk. And when you put people's lives at risk, that's irrespective of political affiliation, race, ethnicity, geography, age, gender. And that's unfortunate because we want to keep people healthy regardless of all of those things. Now, to those folks who have, have done what we've asked them to do, uh, we ask you to continue to be patient because ultimately at the end of the day, any of the guidance that we put forward from a health perspective is strictly from the lens of trying to keep you and your family safe. And we're hopeful that we don't have to put forward or recommend to you all to take further action on, on any of these particular instances, but we have to think about what's going to keep you and your family safe, particularly the kids who aren't eligible to get vaccinated. Uh, and particularly as we want them to get back to school we want them to get back integrated into society, we want to make sure that they can do that as safely as possible. Thank you, Dr. Bales. Appreciate it. And back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Councilmember Glass. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I appreciate the the question that Councilmember Rice just asked regarding regarding travel, and uh, appreciate the the doctor's uh, suggestions there. Because uh, li next month in August, I'm I'm going to be getting on the plane for the first time in, I guess, years now, two years or so, uh, and I'll be visiting my in-laws in a community uh, that has. Uh, substantially higher rate of infection than we do here. Uh, it's a different type of community in a different part of the country. Uh, and, you know, they watch different types of media than, than we might hear. And, you know, that, that segues into the question that, that I've been thinking of listening to this presentation because uh, earlier on uh, when I think it was Dr. Gales, you had shared the information about the zip codes that, that um, the infection rates of the zip codes. And we here in county government have I put a lot of focus on the equity emphasis areas and trying to make sure that uh, all of our communities, especially our communities of color, received uh, vaccinations, uh, received COVID tests, and, and all of the support services um, that they so, so rightly um, deserve. And we've been working really hard in that effort. And the, the proof is that our Latino residents have a higher vaccination rate than our white residents, right? And so the work that we've been doing collectively as government um, has, has been showing signs of success. And so taking that even one step further with regard to the, the zip codes, um, according to the CDC data that, that was shared, 91% of county residents over the age of 18 have received one or two shots. And if you think about that through a different lens, 91% of individuals of voting age have received one or two shots. And here in Montgomery County, uh, in the last election, 79% of Montgomery County residents voted for President Biden and Vice President Harris. And so clearly we have some very smart residents who are listening to the science regardless of their political affiliation. If you look at that spread between the presidential election and the overall population here. And so the point that I'm trying to raise is if we look at the zip codes, do you, do you see a correlation between party affiliation and the way people have voted with regard to the vaccination rates? Is that a level of analysis that we've done? Uh, thank you, Councilman Glass, for your question. I am not aware of that level of analysis on that one. I'm sure we could probably look into that, but I don't at this time have that data available. Sure. So then uh, I'm getting some some real time communication from folks who who uh, are are interested in that that data where where is the census level that uh, the, the sorry the zip code level data that you shared 
Is that public on, on one of our websites, or would you be able to pop that back on the screen so that I and others can take a screenshot of that and some of our in incredibly smart residents uh, who love data can do some of that computing? Sure. I, I believe we post the pulse reports that show kind of the, you know, the percentage of residents vaccinated. Uh, the Excel spreadsheet that I showed is not on a public site. I can share that with you all um, after you know, the conclusion of the meeting and email that to you all to be able to share with your, your residents. Um, and I'm just thinking in terms of we would not have, at least from the health perspective, we would not have a breakdown um, or access to kind of a map that shows political affiliation. We would just simply have the epidemiologic and surveillance information related to the, 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 right. the rates for those zip codes. And, and I think you're right. Um, well, you are right about not doing that level of analysis on your end. Uh, but, uh, you know, seeing uh, what some of our residents do in, in the sleuthing and uh, all of the data that is available on various various uh, resources here in the county. Um, I think that's something that, that others will pick up and as they've been expressing to me in the last few minutes or so, uh, I think they'll do that. So we can, we can follow up on that or everyone can just rewind to the beginning of your presentation where you shared that, uh, that zip code level data. So, so that's all good. Uh, the other thing just, that I want to re-up regarding the data. I think in a previous uh, Q&A with one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Gales, you had, you had shared the percentage of individuals who've been vaccinated who have now, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, relapsed or, or gotten, gotten COVID uh, a second time and, and might be in the hospital. What was that, that percentage again? There were a lot of zeros in there point to the, the thousandth degree or tenth. Sure. so the, the 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 number that i presented was looking at the number of new cases in the last month of individuals who've tested positive who were fully vaccinated divided by the total number of folks who've been fully vaccinated and so using 144 as the numerator and approximately 800,000 as the denominator, that came out to 0.0001%. Uh, a really important number. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that I got that correct and, and that everybody who's following this conversation understands uh, how rare this is, but one, but a rarity that we are not taking lightly and that we need to make sure that we continue stopping the spread and doing everything that's available to us to keep all of our residents healthy and safe. Uh, but it is quite rare that that is occurring here in Montgomery County. So appreciate you doing that back of the envelope math there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just in, to, to summarize, uh, I appreciate the, the efforts that have been done at this time and the urge, urging of us to look, look ahead seeing that this is um, ongoing and that the numbers are trending in, uh, in a direction that we, we might not like, uh, but uh, it is still at this point quite manageable. So if we take those extra steps, uh, we, can, we can try and nip this in the bud, uh, but it'll take all of our efforts. And, um, and again, I appreciate this. And as uh, the council vice president said, uh, this might be the last public update we receive uh, for a number of weeks, but we are all here uh, ready and able to jump into action should the data and science dictate otherwise. So thank you all very much, and um, I hope you get a, a few weeks of rest as well over the next coming weeks. Thank you. And I just wanted to, and getting real time feedback as well, uh, Dr. Liu, our epidemiologist, informed me that the vaccine rates by zip code are a part of the county dashboard. And so residents can see that map that shows the percentage of vaccine uptake in the respective zip codes. Beautiful. Thank you very much. We're, I would only note one point, though, that just to make sure we're clear. Um, the CDC tracks about, I think, about 90,000, a little less than 90,000 doses of vaccine that we actually probably don't have zip code data for. So as you look at the charts that are on the web page, those are the charts that are in the state immunet system, which will obviously give us more uh, uh so like some parts of the county may look lower than they actually are because they're proximal to the district or other places where they may be getting vaccinated um, through means that we don't have a zip code score for. So just, you know, as we look at this, it's a great, I think it's a great analysis. Just remember there's 
a fair chunk of people who are not accounted for in that chart. And, and, and that has been the discrepancy in the dashboard from, from the beginning, which uh, I know we've all been getting questions about as well. So thank yes. you for articulating exactly what that discrepancy has been. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member in the bottom. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I, you know, I don't get tired of, of pointing out the data point regarding the vaccination rates in the Latino community because that was such such a heavy lift and something that we all need to be very proud of uh, while we continue to, you know, do whatever we can to make sure that we hit that same exact milestone for our Black community. But uh, all the credit really does go to the team and also to the community for for responding and for, for really coming forward and for not buying into all the misinformation and disinformation that has been alive and well. And so that is such a wonderful piece of good news. The one piece I wanted to ask um, the team had to do with boosters. You know, folks are, are still wondering what is the latest regarding the need for boosters, especially as breakthrough cases, you know, um, are a thing in the media and, and and folks are just wanting to make sure, do I still have enough immunity? Am I covered? Am I okay? You know, all of those questions that go through people's minds as, as they're trying to discern this, uh, how to mitigate the risk. So uh, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? I know that, you know, for the latest I remember hearing was that there wasn't a need, but any updates uh, that we can communicate to our, our constituents? Thank you, Councilmember Navarro, for your question uh, and update. So, as of this morning, there is no new inf no information uh, new information regarding boosters, other than to say the information that we have so far from the FDA and the CDC suggests that uh, those who have been fully vaccinated do have appropriate immune protection um, in terms of having appropriate levels. At the time, they have not put forward any guidelines or suggestions that uh, the conversation around boosters is imminent. We continue to, do, to use our term from early, earlier contingency plan uh, in the event that that decision will be updated in the future and that we will be able to provide resources to our residents to get those boosters if and when that happens. But unfortunately, at this time, there is no new update from the previous conversation. I will. The only thing I will add to that is, while CDC and FDA have not acted, I think Dr. Fauci made the news on Sunday, as he can typically do, saying essentially that uh, he thinks it is, it may be likely that if there is a booster, it will focus on immunocompromised and older residents. There is no announcement that the, a booster is needed at this point, as Dr. Gales alluded to, but he did make the news on Sunday, saying essentially. He thinks that he he said he thinks it's likely, and I'll put that in quotes because that's I'm looking at the quote right now. He thinks it's likely that it will have to happen sooner or later that uh, uh, immunocompromised and older adults will be asked to get a uh, another booster shot, but that it is not at this time recommended. Thank you. I'll close by saying that uh, you know, especially in a county like ours where you have such a high percentage of immigrant population, uh, it is not lost on those of us that have family members or friends who are still back in other countries who have not had access to the vaccine, um, how fortunate we are here. Our family just lost a dear friend literally 24 hours ago because he did not have access to the vaccine and by the time was flown to the United States, it was too late. And so for those people who are continuing to believe the misinformation and disinformation, just know but there are others who would love to have the exact type of access that we have here. They don't, and unfortunately, it costs their lives, and um, and it causes a lot of pain to to those um, family and, and friends. And and um, and so, you know, just just wanted to to share that because it is quite a interesting time that we're living through, where. Um, all of this uh, type of politis you know, politicization of, of something so important like a life-saving vaccine um, where other people are literally losing their lives hoping that they have that access. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Any other requests to speak? If not, um, thank you all so much for all your great work. 
Uh, I echo Councilmember Glass in uh, saying that I hope you get a little downtime as well over the next few weeks. And Council Vice President Albernoz uh, reminding you that we're, we're happy, while we don't have a scheduled meeting right now, we're happy to reconvene as necessary um, if we're called back to respond to um, a surge in cases. So thank you all for your good work. Stay in close touch with us. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Mr. Malino is here. Welcome, Mr. Howard. Terrific. Uh, next is uh, an update on the Coronavirus Relief Fund, the CRF. I'll turn it over to Deputy Director Craig Howard. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And this morning we'll do um, an update on the CRF. There's three documents that are part of today's update and are attached to the staff report. A memo from the CAO providing an update on the CRF and pay differential, updated expenditure data on COVID-related appropriations, and an updated FEMA reimbursement status document. And I'll just briefly run through the key points for today's update. From the beginning of the pandemic through February, the county paid a total of $88.7 million in COVID-19 hazard pay differential to eligible employees based on agreements the executive made with employee organizations. Since early in the pandemic, the county has been seeking FEMA reimbursement for a portion of those hazard pay expenditures. Um, however, it's important to note that FEMA reimbursement for hazard pay differential was not assumed in the executive's recommended or the council's approved FY22 budget or the approved fiscal plan. Uh, the decision not to assume reimbursement for hazard pay was consistent with cautions expressed by council members that receiving the FEMA reimbursement for pay differential uh, was uncertain. On July 21st, the CAO sent an update to the council president on the CRF, which is attached at circles one through three of the staff report. The CAO's memo states that the executive branch has determined that the county is unlikely to receive FEMA reimbursement for any of the pay differential or for most of the pay differential. There's a small portion, about 1.5 million, that they do anticipate receiving. Um, and the memo also details the steps that the executive branch took as part of the process to, to seek reimbursement from the federal government. As a result, they plan to book hazard pay differential costs of up to $70 million to the CRF as part of the FY21 financial closeout process. These funds have already been expended, but this action will charge them to the CRF instead of having them booked to the county's general fund. Previously, in the in a November update, the executive branch had estimated booking up to $53.9 million in pay differential to the CRF. So as a result, the updated $70 million figure is an increase of $16.1 million over the previous, uh, previous estimate. The funds that the, these expenditures will be booked against were previously appropriated to the CRF NDA in June 2020. And as noted in the March CRF update, the executive branch had been waiting on booking the specific eligible costs to the CRF NDA until it received FEMA reimbursement decisions. Additionally, for the COVID-related appropriations that are funded by the CRF um, included in the spreadsheets attached at circles four through six, the CAO's update notes that after fiscal year closeout, OMB and finance will determine if any of the CRF funded appropriations have remaining appropriation authority that is likely to be unspent, and they'll provide the status update on this in early September. And the last update is on the FEMA reimbursement document, which is attached at circles seven through eight. The most significant news here is that the county will be revising documentation from previous submissions based on new guidance from FEMA um, just this past June, and they anticipate resubmitting the revised documentation, documentation for the previous submissions, as well as some further submissions that have not been sent in yet at, on or around September 1st, 2021. And with that summary, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. President, for any questions. And of course, we have Mr. Medellino with us to provide any additional information and answer questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Medellino. Do you wanna jump in? We get to uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Hucker, members of the council. I'm also joined today by um, Dr. Earl Stoddard um, as the director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. He's our subject matter expert on FEMA. And by Dave Gottesman, the longtime head of our county staff program, who is a, uh, a, a manager within the Department of or the Office of Management and Budget. He has been coordinating the county's efforts to pull together all the information um, from the various county um, departments to submit to FEMA. So um, I, I appreciate the, the, the council packet. Um, we are at the point uh, of the normal cycle of the year where 
Um, we will be getting to the closeout of the fiscal year 21 budget, and we need to, um, as I stated in the memo, and as I think Mr. Howard went over, we need to um, to move the CRF unallocated CRF dollars to the general fund to cover the expenses um, related to the pay differential, as we had assumed in the fiscal plan, um, as we had put aside. Um, in our uh, notification to you in November of last year uh, in order to make sure the general funds position is where we want it to be at the closeout from a reserve standpoint, because if we don't do this um, booking now, um, we would obviously wind up having to cover these expenses out of the general fund reserves, which would put us in a lower position with our reserves when um, after the round and round with FEMA, round and round with the multiple FEMA staff who have been assigned to us over the last year and a half, round and round with our congressional representatives, uh, especially um, Senator Hardin's office, who have worked diligently with us to try to get FEMA to um, to take a different view of, of, our, um, of our requests, that it's now time to do this um, accounting uh, measure in order to put our general fund in the best possible situation um, at the closeout of FY21. Happy to take um, any questions to go over FEMA. You know, we have, during the last year, um, FEMA has experienced a disaster um, like no other. We've experienced a disaster like no other. Um, we've never had a situation, nor has any other government, to the best of my knowledge, had a situation with FEMA where we were submitting reimbursements in the middle of the disaster. So, you know, usually for us, it's a big snowstorm or other weather-related event that winds up triggering eligibility for FEMA reimbursement, and you submit all of the documentation um, months after the, the event um, when you can accumulate everything. We've been doing this consistently from the beginning. Um, FEMA changed rules. They had an initial set of rules. They changed rules during the Trump administration on September 15th um, and severely curtailed what, what we could submit for. The Biden administration changed rules when they came into office on January 20th. Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, which provided um, a different set of resources for both FEMA and for all state and local governments, including to pay um, reimburse people for for the pay differential. So um, we have we have been trying to work through this while the the ground beneath us continued to shift. Uh, we have submitted uh, reimbursements for both um, salaries as well as for lots of operating expenses to FEMA, only to have them return to us to reformat them um, by new guidance um, to reformat them in tranches for specific items pre-September 15th, September 15th to January 20th, and then after January 20th. So um, as you can see on the chart on, um, on circle, um, on circle, what, seven and eight, I believe at the very back of the chart, you can see, you know, we submitted, uh, for example, uh, eight and a half million um, in requests in January, only to have, to be told we had to redo it all, um, to their new formatting and that we've, um, we're finally able to resubmit on July 2nd. Um, the interesting thing is we've already gotten a preliminary determination. Um, so uh, that, that um, these numbers were acceptable. So FEMA, once we can get it all in the correct format for these other expenses, FEMA seems to be moving quickly now, again, now that we have been able to work through all of their different requests for how we submit information. And I think you will hear from both um, Dr. Stoddard and Mr. Gottesman if you, if you have questions for them uh, of, of how that process has worked and how we're back to a, a smoother routine and being able to submit all of those other requests. So um, we, we planned for, for a uh, a poor outcome from FEMA for the pay differential. We booked CRF dollars for that case with the idea of we would be better off planning for the worst case scenario and being pleasantly surprised 
Um, and then with the other FEMA dollars, um, while it has been much slower than anyone had anticipated, and we've had to literally go back to the starting block over and over at their direction, um, we are now back to a, I think, a, a smoother process in being able to submit more and more of our operating expenses and hopefully um, being able to get all of that money quickly into our accounts during um, FY22. Happy to answer questions at this point. Thank you. Council Member Friedson. Thank you, Council President. Uh, appreciate the fact that we're having this hearing. Um, in October uh, of last year, you came before us, Mr. Madalino. It was a very unsettling public hearing on this very issue. Uh, and at that time, you told us that the process has been unacceptable to this point. We were seven months in and had requested FEMA reimbursements at that time for a grand total of $20,000. At the hearing at that time, you expected to submit all personnel costs up to a certain point by November of 2020. And if I recall, you expected to request $120 million in reimbursements before the end of the year, so seven months ago. Subsequent to that, the goalposts have seemingly moved at every single stage. The deadlines have changed, what, when, and how we would be reimbursed have changed. What doesn't seem to have changed are the way that we talk about these issues, and more importantly, the fiscal strategy which is banking so much of the county's fiscal sustainability on the most optimistic scenarios of federal funding and reimbursements. Despite concerns raised by executive staff that it would be exceedingly difficult to be reimbursed, and the profound statement at that hearing restated multiple times that if FEMA can find a reason not to reimburse, they won't. You and the county executive have continued basing so many budgetary decisions on that one exceedingly positive assessment that you apparently received seemingly out of context from someone at FEMA back in July of last year, over a year ago. It's, it's now behind us that nearly none of what we were repeatedly told about differential pay being reimbursed by FEMA turned out to be true. We were told that, our labor partners were told that, many decisions were based off of that. The fact that just 1.5 million out of the 88.7 million is now an accounting issue, as you stated, and it'll be booked accordingly. But the lingering concern is the continued pattern here where the executive branch seems to cherry pick small bits of information and extrapolate it out of context to justify major departures from financial best practices and our county's own fiscal policies. The county budget currently is partially balanced on FEMA reimbursements booked for the first time ever as revenues. For fiscal years 2020 and 2021, how much in FEMA reimbursements do you expect to request? How much have you, re uh, uh, have you requested to date? What has been received and when will the remainder uh, be requested through the June 30 uh, expenditures? There's a chart in the staff report. Is that currently accurate? Yeah, yeah. Up to date as yeah. Of today? The well, it was, um, I think there there is some. Yes, it is accurate as of the as of the twenty first. I, I maybe if Mr. Gottesman wants to say there's any change to this chart, I, I don't believe there there is that would that would impact this whatsoever. I would before he jumps in, I would reiterate that yes, I understand your concern about us banking FEMA um, revenues, FEMA reimbursements of revenues. We have never, ever, ever had this level of expenditure around a disaster before. And to just talk about the revenue side of the ledger without talking about the expenditure side of the ledger is quite important because we, we've had to make a series of expenditures that we've never had to make before um, around, uh, around the disaster recovery, buying a level of personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies, buying testing supplies, and um, all of the things that, that we've done as a result of this that have impacted the expenditure side of the ledger too. So I think if you're, if you're going to say, and, and I think it's very appropriate for us to, to, to consider these FEMA reimbursements in this case as revenues, because otherwise we would be in the situation of having to make substantial 
cuts to the county budget in order to account for these expenditures, even though the federal government, our congressional partners, authorized funding for state and local governments in the CARES Act and in President Biden's American Rescue Plan. So you expressly did not have to do that. So this is, I mean, to me, we just note that part of the reason why the original CRF funds and the additional ARPA funds were provided were specifically for that purpose. And we seem to be trying to have it both ways. And I've raised that concern before. But specifically on this, what is the contingency in the FY22 budget if the pattern remains and we don't receive FEMA reimbursements that you were anticipated before the end of the fiscal year? What is the contingency there? So far, we've made final submissions. We have the initial $31.8 million that was done all the way back in October. And then the final submission up to this point, as far as the chart is concerned, is $4.4 million. So that's a far cry from the amount of money that we have banked uh, as uh, balancing the FY22 budget. What happens if this pattern remains? We're now, by my count, more than 16 months in, almost 17 months into this crisis. We have very little to show for our FEMA reimbursements. What's the contingency plan if the pattern holds? All the evidence up to this point remains true. Well, um, twofold. Uh, one, um, you could, in your review of the unallocated American Rescue Plan dollars, choose to set them aside as a buffer for FY22 to cover FEMA reimbursements who that um, wind up being delayed into the following year, should it not come. Um, I think you will hear from Dr. Stoddard that once we get the documentation into FEMA, into the forms that they have now re-evaluated under or recreated under the Biden administration, they are quick to give us an assessment about what we submitted and um, how it um, and and whether it will be moved along in the process and um, how quickly. So. The challenge that we have is everything that we have heard up to this point about FEMA reimbursements has not been accurate up to this point. Everything, no, this, body, no. everything this body has heard about the timing, about the submissions, about the amounts, about the, uh, the return information, about what we had heard and what that means uh, in terms of the county's fiscal standing have not turned out to be, uh, to, to, to be true. Uh, we could do what you have suggested, although I will note that based on uh, even what the county executive proposed in his recommended budget, much less what we uh, formally approved, there isn't enough to cover the total balance as a contingency. So e even if we did what you suggested, there's literally not enough to cover all of it. You could cover a portion of that. Is the county executive or are you formally suggesting to the county council to maintain as a contingency a portion of the ARPA funds in order to protect against the possibility that FEMA reimbursements may take longer than expected. Is that no? That the I was, I was answering. Is? I was answering your question of what are contingencies. If you so want, the county to, executive doesn't have a contingency. Is that the that, answer? No, because we are confident. We are confident now in the in now that we have been told by FEMA how they want the information. Now that we have one administration in place and will be in place for the foreseeable future at the federal level. There's not going to be another revision of what's eligible and ineligible costs that we are now in this situation with every other state and local government to more rapidly submit our documentation in the form and function that they want in order to make decisions. I'm gonna move on to other questions, but I will just note that your confidence that all this money will be received before the end of the year is by definition a position that you have no contingencies. I'll just I, now, wait, move, move by the end that. of the year, I, I will be very clear. I asked you a contingency, and your response was that the council could do something if they wanted to, but the executive isn't suggesting it because the executive is exceedingly confident, I guess, similar to the uh, exceedingly positive statement that was received by FEMA uh, over a, a, a year ago. Because okay. we have, we, we will not close the FY22 budget, uh, the books, until until the end of July of 22. We have 12 months to get and we're the, almost 17 months in and we have very little to show for it. But uh, let's, let's move on to other questions. 
back in that very unfortunate public hearing that we had on this topic originally on October, I believe it was October the 13th, you told us that you were completely changing strategies, you were creating a new team, and you were hiring this consultant to provide expert guidance so that we could fix the unacceptable situation as you described it and avoid, I thought, the very situation that we're in right now so that we could bring in folks who uh, understand how this process works and could help us. How much are we paying the FEMA consultant? How, how much taxpayer dollars are going to this FEMA consultant who has gotten us to this point today? I'll have to pull the figures, but I would just simply note that the the call. I, I'll I'll provide the numbers, uh, Council Member. I would just note though that the 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 funds themselves that you actually can charge an M and A fee, and that would actually allow us to get reimbursement for those services themselves. Uh, so the the reimbursement those those funds will actually be reimbursable as well. I'll provide you the documentation because it's been in a couple of different tranches. I want to get you the full accurate. But we have to pocket the money and then wait for the reimbursement. That's the way everything works. With taking you, you put a out. long time. So yes. it does have a cost, even if it gets fully reimbursed. Correct. Okay. Uh, at that meeting in October, Dr. Stoddard, you had noted that it took six county employees working nearly full time for two weeks in order to pursue a FEMA reimbursement at that time, which totaled $20,000. I raised at that meeting the concern that if the cost of submitting reimbursements so dramatically exceeds the cost of the reimbursements themselves, then we need to dramatically rethink our strategy. How much taxpayer money between the consultant and the total staff time did we spend on the reimbursements for personnel costs, which have now resulted in what we expect to be one and a half million dollars in reimbursements? Well, well, Dave is considering um, the the answer to that if we have the ability to provide that answer at this moment. I would point out we don't expect we're not thrilled at all with the amount of reimbursement we're getting for personnel costs. 1.5 million will not be the total we receive. We will receive more than that as we submit. We now know these are the functions that they considered eligible for reimbursement. We only submitted those personnel costs for the first few months. We will submit all of the additional months of coverage over the, the pay differential for reimbursement. So we will get more than 1.5 million. Yes, it will be probably in the magnitude of 5 million or less, but it's not just 1.5 million to clarify the, the record. Okay. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mr. Gottesman. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Stoddard. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the team that you put together, which are some of our most talented people in county government. And I'm just concerned that if the likelihood, as we have known from the beginning, that it would be incredibly difficult to get some of these reimbursements, that we stuck to this idea that we needed to get reimbursed because it was part of the justification for pursuing the policy, and it's going to cost more taxpayer dollars to request it than it will from what we actually receive. So in addition to some of the other things that I have requested prior to this hearing, I, I do think that we need to have a running total of the amount of staff time and consultant costs that have been dedicated to FEMA reimbursements and then a running total of the actual reimbursements themselves. Because I do think that this is a lingering challenge as we continue to move through this that, you know, if we're dedicating some of our most talented county uh, employees to, to this effort, and it's not as fruitful as we think it might be, then at a certain point, we may need to rethink this entire strategy. Okay. I would only add, Council Member, that I think that, um, when, particularly when you're, when we were doing the first submissions, we were learning, it took more time than it would to replicate over future submissions. Meaning, once you build the infrastructure and systems to collect the data and have it be in more real time, um, you know, the narrative created as opposed to doing it after the fact, you get more efficient over further experience. Many of these county employees that we're utilizing, um, besides the emergency management staff, had very little to no familiarity with the FEMA process going into this process. And so we've educated them about that moving forward. So I, I would suggest, and we can certainly provide you the numbers of what, what staff time has been dedicated to this. I have no, I have no, uh, no question that we'll get vastly more in FEMA reimbursement than, than uh, that will cost the staff, but also that 
we've gotten more efficient over time so that the initial investment in the first few months of doing this reimbursement was um, more time consuming and less effective than it is today by a by orders of magnitude. And so obviously I think that um, you know the team has obviously been a team for more than a year now and has gotten at doing the documentation in spite of the fact that FEMA's goalposts have moved multiple times in multiple different venues. I just would add one final thought to that, which is the most of the members of the FARS team that we recruited to do this may have otherwise been sitting idle. Um, you know, for example, some were from MCPL, from libraries, and, and uh, it, was, it was the best use of their time. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't additional in that sense. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think that as we move towards fully opening all of our regular activities in county government, that that you know, has changed, and I appreciate everything, Dr. Stoddard, that you said. The challenge is that was the same story we heard back in October, you know, that, you know, the the unacceptable situation that was being remedied was being remedied by bringing this group together, by bringing in an expert consultant, by, you know, changing the way that we were doing it, and here we are nine months later, and it doesn't seem like, you know, there has been as many changes as we would like. Now, I'm hoping that what you're saying is true, and it turns out that there is just a dramatically quick response to all of these new requests that come through, and all of a sudden this backlog is satisfied. But up to this point, the council has not received anything to back up just about anything that we have heard regarding FEMA reimbursements and regarding specifically this differential pay uh, question. And now we've spent a tremendous amount of time, energy, effort, and taxpayer money to try to get things reimbursed that never were going to be reimbursed, it seems, uh, now that we've learned. All right, final question. What specifically have we learned from this episode? How will it change your strategy, Mr. Madalino, and the county executive's fiscal strategy or our approach to federal reimbursements moving forward? Well, um, I... I do hope we are never again in a situation of a global pandemic where we are we are trying to re ask for reimbursement. I mean, if you're asking broadly, I mean, right now, I mean, right now, we just got terrible news. Terrible news that we've been heading down a rabbit hole that was not going to get us to where we wanted to go. Generally, when you get bad news and you learn things, you adapt and you adjust to them. I'm trying to find out whether or not we're going to change course, adjust our approach, change the way that we're doing things. Well, again, so in order to address I, the fact that this is not a good situation. So I, I, I do want to, I, I do want to separate and I, and I worry that um, uh, because you're so familiar with these, with, with this information and you've been engaged in this conversation um, that in your questions that someone um, who it does not have your degree of familiarity is not confusing our requests for reimbursement on a range of non-personnel issues with FEMA, which have been complicated and time consuming, and we've had to deal with rules changes and reformatting of submissions, but we have not fundamentally changed our assumptions, nor do I think there is a reason to fundamentally change our assumptions about what is going to be reimbursed by that, and the fact that the Biden administration changed the reimbursement from 75% to 100%. As, and the, the first submission we got, where we got 75%, we got the other 25% um, during the, the first few months of the Biden administration. So um, on that standpoint, um, which was submitted the defense, in October. The huh? Which was submitted in October. It was submitted in October. We got a reply within a matter of weeks that it was approved. We got the 75% a few weeks after that, and then we got the other 25% um, in the beginning of April, you know, considering the Biden administration started really at the beginning of February, that was a, uh, a quick turnaround as they had to provide every jurisdiction their, their 25%. So, um, so I'm just saying from an operating standpoint, um, from an operating expense reimbursement standpoint, nothing has fundamentally changed. The schedule has gone long. Um, we will, we will, you know, we will wind up receiving dollars slower than we anticipated. Um, 
this is not because of our doing as much as it is they're constantly changing the formatting. Now that you've got a team in place at FEMA, we can submit all the documentation. I think Earl, I think in the, the report from, um, from Dave, uh, you can see the emergency management expects to get um, much of the, the, um, the submissions that are listed as what, 2, 2.5, 4, 5, and 6 in by September 1st. Um, for the operating expenses, and then we will go back with what we've learned in the response from FEMA about personnel costs. We will submit the documentation for the personnel costs for the post-August of 20 period that they said were eligible for reimbursement. So if function A was deemed eligible for reimbursement for that period of time, we will submit the documentation for that for those expenses on personnel that are personnel related for the for the period of September to January and then for the post January period, as long as we had those expenses related to the paid differential, which of course ended in in February. I appreciate the indulgence of college. I will just point out that the thirty one point eight million that you're referencing was for things that you admittedly said were obviously going to be reimbursed things like personal protective equipment and other things from DGS from March to August. And so I think it's disingenuous to compare those directly to everything else when the other main question has always been this overarching question of personnel costs, which the, which the administration has taken exceedingly optimistic viewpoints on. And it turns out those exceedingly optimistic uh, viewpoints were for naught. And now we are left, you know, frankly, with a, a, a very challenging outcome and severe questions moving forward. I'll just close by saying I'm more disappointed in the fact that based on this new news that there are no contingencies, that there are no changes, that there is no change in approach or uh, adapting to the new information uh, that we received. Uh, that to me is more disappointing than this news, which frankly I've been unfortunately expecting for a long time. I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Raymer. Thank you very much. Mr. Madalino said that they've been planning for the worst case scenario. Uh, I think what they've been doing is creating the worst case scenario. This entire compensation arrangement has always been unaffordable and unsustainable. And if a good deal that was fair to employees and yet a responsible use of federal disaster relief funding. If a good agreement had been struck, none of this would matter that much because it would have been affordable with or without a FEMA reimbursement. And we would have all been proud to fund it, even if FEMA said that they couldn't. That's the problem. The problem is that the differential should have been several million dollars or some number of million dollars, but not 80 or 90 million dollars. And it is an egregious abuse. It is an egregious abuse to have a 80 plus million dollar deal that every one of those pennies is federal disaster relief money that should have gone to small businesses, small business owners losing their life savings, renters worried about getting evicted, vaccination door to door campaigns to get people vaccinated. That's how that money was supposed to be used. And yes, for frontline employees, fair hazard pay. Park and planning provided fair hazard pay, agreed to with the county employee union. It was several hundred thousand dollars, as I recall. Uh, other jurisdictions around the region provided fair hazard pay, a tiny fraction of what the county executive agreed to. That's the problem. And now we're ending up finding out, as many of us expected all along, or several of us perhaps expected all along, that the government's not going to pay for this. And we're on our own. I have been sounding the alarm about this arrangement since, really since the summer, but in urgently since the fall. And we're here now almost a year later with the utterly predictable outcome. 
it's it's an egregious abuse. That that's what we are grappling with, and it's a it's a low a low moment in in a lot of low moments. Well. So, I- Councilmember Reamer, the county executive does not agree with your assessment that we overpaid firefighters and police officers, nurses, social workers during the middle of uh, a global pandemic when we were asking them to put themselves and their families' um, lives at risk um, in providing the quality services that we demanded um, as, as, as a community. I understand that, but the county executive also took this action unilaterally without the approval of the county council. And that would have produced a better outcome. We could have all discussed what we thought was fair and then arrived at something that was something we could all support. But the county executive agreed to something unilaterally. It has never been approved by the council and the council had to find a way ultimately months and months and months later to try to unwind it. So I understand that's the county executive's position, but I don't agree with it. And I understand that the employees deserve hazard pay that is fair to them and is also a responsible use of the federal disaster relief money. And, you know, everybody is facing risks. I have never seen data that showed that county employees faced a higher level of risk or have had worse outcomes from COVID than similar private sector employees. If you have that information, I would certainly welcome to see it, but I have not seen that. There were certain categories of employee we know that are riskier. The 911 call center is a good example. You know, that's a high risk job. There are certain functions we know are high risk, but in general, you know, Hazard pay is merited, but what this funding agreement did was just unaffordable. And now, again, it's all money that was also needed by other people in the community. And, you know, thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any other response? Any uh, Council Member Navarro? Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to just make a comment here. Um, This has been a very difficult time that we all have had to face, and we did it, uh, and we responded, and we all came together um, to put forth all kinds of relief initiatives to address the needs of our residents, and we had to do it because we had no other option. Um, But we should not, you know, we need to be very clear that there is no doubt that we wanted to do whatever we could to compensate our employees fairly for what they were doing. That was very important, just like we were trying to do whatever we could to make sure that we provided everything, food, rental relief, access to testing, to vaccines, all of those things. And so it's not mutually exclusive, and I really, really reject the notion that somehow us speaking up and saying that we needed to monitor and watch the amount and the level of expenditures regarding the differential pay somehow is this binary conversation about either you care for the employees or you don't. That's not what it's about. That was never what it was about. It was about balancing all of these extraordinary needs that were popping up on a everyday basis and responding to our residents and to our employees and getting, you know, making sure everybody was safe. So I want to reject that binary description or, or somehow framing that because we are alarmed by this particular development, which we have been asking about and inquiring about for a long time, somehow means that we were not that we are not grateful for what our employees have done. What we're trying to do here is is to make sure that we are stewards of our taxpayers' funding and of the federal funding that came forward that was so critical. That's what we're trying to do. 
And I want to associate myself with my colleagues' comments in the sense that this needed to be handled differently, and it wasn't. That needs to be acknowledged. Okay, that there are needs out there that we have not been have not been able to respond appropriately and at scale. That is a reality. That we've been fortunate because our residents have stepped up and cooperated. Yes, that is true. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still extraordinary needs out there that we have not been able to address. And so we just need to get real. And again, I understand it's silly season because it's campaign season, but let's not start putting things on the table where it's, again, this binary conversation about either or. We needed to do it all. We had to make sure to be, you know, fiscal stewards while responding. And I'm sorry, Mr. Madalino, but it's not like this is the first time that we brought up this issue. And Unfortunately, it's been very difficult to, you know, to trust the information that was coming back because at every step of the way, the worst case scenario has come forth. So something needs to change. It needs to be acknowledged. It's the only way that things are going to improve. And I really hope that we are a lot more transparent. Communication also needs to flow in real time to our own central staff because we rely on our council central staff for a lot of this information so that we can track everything appropriately. So that's all I'm going to say for this. You know, I mean, obviously there are lots of questions and things that we're going to have to track, but seriously, I, I don't want to get into the whole, you know, who, who cares more about the employees and who doesn't. Um, because this has been a very difficult time with a lot of loss for a lot of people. Uh, and funding will be needed going forward to remedy so many things that we haven't even uncovered yet. So this is, this story is not over. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other. Yeah. And this can be our staff and the executive staff wants to comment just, just clearly for the public, what is the delta between what you submitted for reimbursement and what was accepted? Well, how much money, how much was accepted, how much was not? You want me to address that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay, certainly. So uh, for the first submission, 100% of the submission was approved and has been reimbursed. How much was that? That was the 31, the initial 31.8 from October, uh, fully reimbursed by April 1 of this year. Um, for the and second, that is, submit, that's all for, uh, that was all for uh, the, the PPE March to August. That's bucket 1.0. I'm just, I'm referring to the, to the, um, chart in your packet. Great. Uh, for bucket 2.0, the 31.2, which is the, you know, the, the large point of contention today, um, uh, 1.5 of that is expected to be approved by FEMA, and the remainder um, w uh, we expect to be denied, as you know, as per FEMA's. And that's all re that's all reimbursement for uh, for pay. Correct. And so that's twenty nine. That's all. That's all uh, yeah, well, yeah. Let's let's call it twenty nine point five to twenty nine point <laughs> seven. Um, the other uh, the 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 other delta that. The only other delta that currently exists, because bucket 2.5, um, we expect everything that was documented to be submitted. The only other delta that we we referenced earlier was in bucket 3.0. The original full documentation was 9.9 .9 million. Of that 9.9, um, 1 1.3 of it is part of this reorganization process, and 4.4 of it made the final submission that Rich referred to earlier, the CAO, excuse me, referred to earlier, um, that FEMA just, just left in, in name. And the remainder we expect to, to be denied. Uh, all other submissions, as noted in the packet, are currently being revised as per very recent FEMA, you know, guidance about how to bucket things and how to organize things. Um, and then bucket 8.0, which is March to June, um, as things have started to taper off generally, mostly HHS related stuff uh, from that point on is currently being in the collection and documentation phase. 
So, yeah. so the only real, the two deltas, if we just <laughs> use them, is the, from a denial standpoint, is the 29.7 in bucket 2.0 and um, about three from bucket 3.0. Got it. So 30, 32.7 million. Yeah. And, and I guess it, it's, it bears repeating, you know, the, the, the goalpost analogy has been used a couple of times today. The, the goal, anytime goalposts are moved, they, they were moved by the federal government. So I think that that's important to acknowledge. And we've, you know, been consistently playing catch up and looking to understand and, you know, changes in administration and changes in rules. And, you know, that's, that's what we've all been contending with. I mean, there, there are, there are things that, to this day, just don't make sense to me as someone who's been, you know, part of the front end of this process. Uh, just to give one example, um, something like uh, contact tracing, right? We did a fair amount of contact tracing throughout the, the winter. And this is a function that we had to uh, stand up and pay for only because of COVID, only because of the pandemic. And FEMA ruled that contact tracing is not ineligible. Like, right. Things like that, just they just don't make sense to me. But we've yeah. consistently had to play by their rules and their their shift rules. So uh, I'll, I'll just say that. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. And if you could go on mute, Dave, because I think I'm getting feedback. You got it. Uh, I, I think that's an important point. I, I'll say two things just very quickly. So 32.7 million for the public. That's what was spent that will not be reimbursed. That was previously stated to be reimbursed. For much of that for re for uh, personnel uh, for hazard pay. There's two problems here. And the people know, I, I think we should have been pay, paying uh, hazard pay. I think everyone says we should we should have paid some hazard pay. The discussion of what it should have been and when we should have had that discussion, that did not happen appropriately. Real, realizing, and I think we all understand that, right? Regardless of, we might we would have disagreed on what the amount should have been and how long it should have happened. And those are fair disagreements. And I probably would have lean to the side of a more generous uh, allocation. But the process was flawed. Understanding it was in a pandemic and we were trying to deal with things, we didn't know how long it was gonna last. I know there's a lot of reasons for that. And I, I just wanna make sure that we fix that going forward, right? And that we have clear understanding so that the council, the legislative body that appropriates funding and the executive who negotiates agreements can be more on the same page. And I think we all share that. That being said, uh, you know, am I losing sleep over 32.7 million that went to our employees? No, I'm not. Um, and so uh, we can do both things. We can have a better process uh, and we can agree on the, and, and play our, our respective roles uh, and respect uh, you know, the, this tremendous sacrifice uh, of our employees and be a model for others. It's still unconscionable to me that so many private sector employees gave nothing as our workers were out there uh, and many putting themselves at risk, our most essential folks. So so I just wanted, I appreciate my colleagues' comments and I just wanted to make those those two points. Thank you, Mr. Council, Council Member Jawando, I, and I had to take myself off mute. I apologize if there's any feedback. Just just one one last point to add. Just about about the documentation generally, you know, our for the FARS team, our task, you know, our mission from the very beginning when we started this work in, in October of last year was to document every expenditure, whether we were certain it would be eligible in FEMA's eyes, or whether there was even a possibility, whether it fell into a very large gray area, and you know, that's that's what what we've done, and I just think that, uh, you know, should there have been a big neon sign at the top of this chart saying, you know, not everything in doc, the column mark documented is a guarantee, but possibly. But again, our, our job was to document everything, even if there was a, a, a chance that we would uh, that we would receive it back because <laughs> the other side of the, the, the coin would be even worse if we had not documented things that ultimately were deemed eligible. That's certainly a discussion that we would not want to want to have. So just wanted to put that in as well. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you all for your work. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and I think it's important to note, Council Member Joando, for the public that uh, Dave's, the report that is on page seven and eight, the OMB has been sending those charts over on a monthly basis all of this calendar year. We were submitting it on a biweekly basis during the, the prior, uh, during the prior, um, 
during the prior year. So um, we, we were distributing um, information um, where, where we were endeavoring to update you all and the central staff as to what, what was going on on a regular basis. And you, we went from the biweekly to the monthly process in conversation with the council staff, certainly because that's when our side of the budget work was being ramped up and it was a lot for OMB to be consistently doing it. So it. not, not in a, out of an effort to, to not submit the documentation, but in a way to be um, a bit more reasonable in our own um, staff demands. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for the briefing. We got to move on. Uh, we're behind, but appreciate your time. Um, okay. Uh, one quick announcement. I'd like to move up item um, 4D to the beginning of item the sec section four, um, ZTA 1907 telecommunication towers, just to accommodate council member Navarro who has to leave by one o'clock for another appointment. Um, let's quickly interview the um, county executive's appointments for the regional service center directors. Um, uh, Ms. Luisa Cardona, Mr. Pete Fosselman, um, Mr. Jacob Newman, and Mr. Greg Gregory Wims. Is everybody with us? Mr. Manolino, did you have some opening? Yes, uh, first very, of all, thank very you. Brief thank, open comments. Great. Thank you very much, um, uh, council members, for reviewing these nominations so quickly. I think you will find four very strong candidates who bring a diverse background. Um, some, like uh, Mr. Wims, has held every position um, in our community from a leadership standpoint in the nonprofit world and is an eighth generation resident of Montgomery County. Pete Fossilman, former mayor of the town of Kensington, has worked on White Flint, White Oak, um, well known to many of you. We bring in um, Jacob Newman, uh, a long time Silver Spring resident uh, who is um, been a, a leader in the efforts to um, provide opportunities for youths in our community. And then Louisa Cardona, who would be returning to our area um, after serving with the um, Deputy Director of the Atlanta Mayor's Office of Immigration Affairs. We look forward to working with all of them. We hope you confirm them quickly today um, as we stand up and hopefully revitalize and grow the regional services programs. Thank you, Mr. Um, President. Hopefully I went as fast as possible to try to get it out there. It's like speaking on the House floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madalino. Um, welcome to everybody. We're so, uh, congratulations on your nominations. Uh, we're gonna try and catch up here. Um, I'll take everybody in um, alphabetical order and then, rot and then uh, um, uh, rotate to keep it fair. So Ms. Cardona, you're first. Um, First, can you tell us about your background and qualifications as they re relate to your potential appointment? Absolutely. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me and for the honor of this nomination. I have over 10 years of experience in public sector experience um, working in the private sector. For the past six years, I've actually worked for the City of Atlanta and Mayor Bottoms' office and an executive position where I've had to do many of the same things that this position is looking for, which is work with different uh, community groups, ensure that equity principles are being followed, um, work with multiple departments, business community. So I've done a little bit of everything um, in terms of that. And I was also previously with Casa the Maryland where I worked a lot with uh, the county as well. Great, thank you. Mr. Fossilman? Good, good morning, everyone. And I appreciate the opportunity to work in this new capacity for the council and, um, and our staff. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm former mayor of Kensington, and you know the BCC website uh, clearly states that we bring small town responsiveness to all the communities that we serve, and so I think it's a good a good background to have been a mayor. And I believe also my former capacity as the deputy secretary of state and our current master plan ombudsman, um, I bring a plethora of knowledge to better serve the BCC community, especially since it's um, one of the, you know, it's the heart of all the land development within Montgomery County right now. And my background is in urban planning and landscape design. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Thank you, Council President and members of the council. Um, as has been mentioned, I've been uh, employed with Latin American Youth Center and Maryland Multicultural Youth Centers for the past 13 years, seven of which have been here in Montgomery County and uh, I'm officed in Silver Spring, I, I live in Silver Spring. And over these past seven years, I've had a wonderful opportunity to engage with a variety of stakeholders who I think will be relevant to, to the work as a regional service center director. These of course include uh, residents across the entire county, 
uh, many of whom are based in, in Silver Spring and surrounding areas. Uh, managing a portfolio of about 20 plus contracts, a couple of million dollars uh, from philanthropy, local, state and federal government. Uh, workforce development being a, a strong pillar of a lot of what I have done over the past several years has afforded me the opportunity to connect with several local and regional businesses. And lastly, uh, a deep relationship with community-based organizations uh, as a nonprofit leader, as a uh, outgoing vice president of nonprofit Montgomery, a graduate of leadership Montgomery. Uh, I believe all experiences have afforded me the, the personal connections and professional connections from such a wide variety of stakeholders and institutions. Thank you, Mr. Wims. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. Thank you for this opportunity. As stated there early, I'm a, a born in Montgomery County raised uh, and worked most of my life in Upper Montgomery County, uh, have been on most of the nonprofit boards in Montgomery County, and have worked very closely with the County Council over the years. So I look forward to this opportunity to serve the citizens of Upper Montgomery County and the government of Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fosselman, you're first. Describe your experience identifying and assessing community needs, concerns, and gaps in services and resolving problems with department directors and or recommending appropriate actions to a chief administrative officer. Well, as the master plan ombudsman, one of my primary responsibilities is to field community complaints from residents, businesses, and developers um, and work with county departments such as DPS, DOT, and the current regional services directors. So if confirmed as the DCC director, I would begin by meeting with the stakeholders to understand the needs and identify their issues. And in addition, I think it's extremely important that the five of us, meaning the directors, um, work together as a team and especially with our friends at the Office of Community Partnerships. Thank you, Mr. Newman. I couldn't agree with my colleague, Mr. Fossum and Moore. Um, the, 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 the deep importance of working collaboratively as a team and with OCP. Um, and this has really been uh, the heart of a lot of my work over the past several years with, with the Youth Center. Um, a community-based approach, meeting young people and their families, uh, representing those needs and, and particular issues uh, through a network of, of peer organizations and a variety of agencies within county government. Um, I think, you know, just as an example, um, recently, and, and I was uh, on this last uh, session, uh, COVID, and, and the way that we have been able to pivot to serve um, young people and their families across the entire county demonstrates an ability to reach uh, those residents, uh, you know, wh wherever they may be, and uh, often hard to reach, and, and really represent that up to a number of stakeholders. Thank you, Mr. Wims. Yes, I think, uh, as my colleague said, and I would say that the most important thing, I think, is that we actually listen to the residents of the county. Uh, when there are problems that come up, we try to work with them, the county executive and the county council, especially to make sure that no council member is caught off guard by any new issues that may arrive. I take pride in the fact that I've worked very closely, uh, especially as it relates to the police and it comes to the minority community, and that's some just one of the many ways I think that we need to work together to make sure that the citizens are represented and that the citizens are heard. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Cardona. Well, most recently I was senior advisor um, to the mayor in the city of Atlanta in COVID-19 and census vaccination campaigns, specifically leading outreach campaigns uh, for immigrant communities and ensuring that all 16 departments across the city were providing services equitably, particularly to limited English speakers. Also, I was involved when the recent hate crime shooting against Asian American communities and ensuring that those communities had voices within our Atlanta Police Department um, in order to suggest changes that they wanted to see within the department. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Newman, you're first. What do you see as the most important issues facing the geographic region to, in, to which you may be appointed? Well, in, in, in no particular order and, and certainly not all inclusive, I think that um, certainly the, the Purple Line construction uh, there around it and, and other transportation issues are, are of particular importance to residents and businesses. Um, the issues of housing and homelessness and, and the, the need to keep humans centered in that conversation um, 
and, and of course, uh, topic of today and, and yesterday is um, the next or continued uh, approach of the downtown urban districts um, relevant to a bid proposal as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wims. Yes, so uh, first we say that we have to uh, support the hub in, in, in Montgomery County, uh, in Upper Montgomery County. We had that at the was at the uh, Black Rock Center, but now it's at the Regional Center. With a, if I'm appointed, I will have that in my building. The second is transportation issues, not only just the 270 and so forth, but White's Ferry. We also have economic development. Uh, there are plans that have been in place, and we want to continue to work to grow Germantown as well as Clarksburg. So I think those are some of the key issues that we face today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cardona. I think for the region, really looking at um, keeping an eye on redevelopment projects in uh, Wheaton and Glenmont, ensuring that the community has a voice, particularly within small business community, and that their voices are heard within these redevelopment plans. And looking at the plaza and making sure that now that we are reaching somewhat of a post uh, COVID-19 era, that it is fully utilized and that the community is able to access it. Thank you, Mr. Fossilman. Well, Mayor, I chaperone the 2012 Kensington Sector Plan through the approval process with the county and the planning board. Um, several residents outside of the town were in opposition to the plan and to help bring them in and some buy-in for them into the process, I created an ad hoc committee with one representative from each of the adjacent communities. And I think in the end that worked out, there was much compromise. Um, more recently, the county executive and the county council received concern from East County residents about the county's, um, what they perceive as a lack of attention to White Oak versus White Flint. Um, and they worked very closely with the um, Jeru Bandi, the East County Director for Regional Services. We reached out to stakeholders. Um, we also uh, worked closely with other departments and we shared a list of accomplishments in the East County. And then we began consultant, excuse me, cons discussions more recently with the consultant to help evaluate the progress of the master plan. And then very quickly last year, uh, um, sort of a controversial issue in White Oak was with varying opinions was the proposed 495 uh, Beltway slip ramp. Um, Drew and I again met, had several meetings with DOT and residents and the result was an excellent compromise um, with a future revisit to that slip ramp. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Wims, um, you're next. How will you collaborate and communicate effectively with the district council members in your area and the rest of the county council? As I said in my opening statement, uh, the council members should never be caught off guard. I have uh, most of them in my district's phone number, they have mine, but also working closely with the staff. Uh, so not only the council members directly, but the staff. I think that's so important. And then I would also see cooperation uh, with the community leaders. And I'll give one example. When we wanted to build the Boys and Girls Club in Germantown, there was some opposition about traffic, et cetera. But we brought the community together, and we brought the elected officials together. As a matter of fact, state, federal, and local county council members. And we were able to build that successful Boys and Girls Club. Thank you. Ms. Cardona. I think with constant and clear communication also by getting to know really the priorities of each council member and ensuring that they have any priorities that I see coming across my desk that I know might interest them to make that constant and clear communication and open up meetings and civic participation within community members and council as well. And Mr. Fossilman? Um. Well, I think recovering from COVID-19 error and socially and economic wise is important. Um, and no more, or no more than ever now, the county's service consolidation hubs are important. And I plan to engage with the one that's in the BCC cluster, which would be Twinbrook. Um, another very important issue in that area are the master plans, specifically Twinbrook, White Flint, and Bethesda, as well as the new Thrive 2050 plan. Um, and then on another note, of course, transportation, uh, community amenities, and the business improvement districts are also hot topics. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Newman. Yes, at the risk of being a little bit repetitive, I, I would open myself to working with each of you directly and, of course, your staff. I've had the great uh, pleasure and privilege of doing so as uh, the managing director here at LAYC. Um, 
Additionally, you know, I think that in this modern uh, media day, following each of you on uh, Twitter and, and your social media uh, channels has really kept me in touch with what is important to you, um, and, and I would look to expand upon that. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Cardona, you're, you're first. If appointed, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? Yeah, uh, racial and equity issues are really a personal passion of mine that I have dedicated most of my professional career to. And I know that this starts with trust, it's especially trust within previously um, disengaged communities um, where you have to build a lot of trust. So working each day to create lines of communication to be present for those communities so that I start building that trust, but also being very open and sincere and critical with county government when I see see barriers of equity come across and what we actions we need to take as a county in order to overcome those barriers. Thank you. Mr. Fasselman. Mr. Fasselman. Okay, we'll come back. Mr. Newman. Thank you. Um, I think that I would plan to build upon what has been uh, the better part of about the past decade here in the county, uh, meeting young people, families, and, and community in general, wherever they are at. And I think there's a strong reputation of our organization and also of my leadership uh, of a staff to do so. And so I think that you know committing to uh, that work in, in a wide variety of issues from education housing, policing, transportation, and, and access to, to community resources in general, um, I would look to collaboratively bring together among our team of regional service center directors, office of community partnerships, and, and others, uh, a longstanding commitment to ensuring those, to, to ensuring that all have a voice in the process and have a, an opportunity to access uh, the wealth of resources here in the county. Thank you. Mr. Fosselman alerted me that he's having technical difficulties. Mr. Wims. Yes. Uh, all of my life, uh, this has been a key issue for me. Uh, as most of you know, I was the president of NAACP, who we tackled a lot of these problems, not only at the uh, uh, school level, but the county level, as well as in the federal government. But also as the founder of the Victims' Rights Foundation, what we found today as it relates to all people who live in the county, all people of color, as well as the majority uh, relationship, we have started, especially when it comes to Stop Asian Hate, we, and I might say myself as a leader, took the lead uh, in Montgomery County on that issue. Uh, and we, and I feel very strongly that this is something that is needed in Montgomery County, and I will do all I can to make sure that every American, every citizen is treated uh, equally. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Fossilman, let me know if you're back. Um, Without him, Mr. Newman, you're first on the last question. Are there any potential conflict? Oh, Mr. Fossilman, do you want to try the second, the recent one? If, uh, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? Yes, and I apologize. I apologize, to Council President. I am having technical difficulties, um, and I actually missed one of the questions before, and I didn't answer appropriately. But um, equity is about opportunity. Um, and outreach and accessibility are keys to an environment of equity and justice, in my opinion. And that means including those who are marginalized is imperative. Um, specifically, I plan to reach out to the service providers in the BCC area, like Bethesda Cares, St. John's, and Interfaith Works. And then I also believe interaction with the Office of Community Partnerships is crucial. Great. Um... So you're first on the next question. Are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Uh, no, there are not. And if I may quickly add, um, I missed one of the questions. And um, About I, have very, I have a very good relationship with Council Member Friedson and his chief of staff, as well as the rest of the council members and their chiefs. And I do plan to keep in touch with all of them. Thank you so much. Terrific. Mr. Newman, do you have any conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? I do not. Mr. Wims. I do. I do not. And Ms. Cardona. I do not. All right. Um, council member in Nevada. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I um, want to thank all of you for stepping up to this 
to be considered for this role. Uh, this is a very important role, one that has been uh, changed uh, quite a bit from a long time. There's been a lot of different iterations, but as you know, our county has grown considerably. Um, the question about equity has been also so important because as it stands right now, the latest information that we have received regarding our demographics, we know that of the five councilmanic district four a majority of color, with obviously district four being predominantly Latino and district five being predominantly black. And so you play a really pivotal role in being that liaison to our community. Um, I think with the exception of district one, <laughs> when we talk about equity, we're talking about the majority of our residents. We're talking about not just, uh, you know, marginalized communities. We, we mean the majority of our residents in those areas. And so I think that this new iteration with this new leadership means that hopefully each and every one of you will look very carefully at the lessons we've learned through COVID-19. Um, as Council President Hucker knows, because we spent some time together this weekend on a retreat, uh, what is being written about is that the pandemic has literally been an accelerator. So many of the trends that we were tracking have now been accelerated. And we as local governments, I think, are going to have to be ready to address that, um, which means that the usual paradigms and the way that we look at things and how we have been talking about things have to change so that we can really meet this moment. Um, and again, I think you will play a really important role uh, in helping out. Um, I, I think particularly Ms. Cardona, I welcome you back. Wheaton has changed a lot, as you know, since you were probably here in the rest of District 4. Um, and I think it's poised for this, again, new, new, um, you know, new level, but a lot needs to, needs to happen. Um, towards that end, I just wanted to ask a really quick question, especially with you, Ms. Cardona, since you come from, you know, Atlanta with a very different demographic um, makeup really vibrant city, I know. Um, but here in Montgomery County, you know, a, a lot of times we say we want to incorporate all the voices, all the community, et cetera. When it, you know, when, when you think about what the role that you're about to step into, how, what kind of best practices or innovative ideas do you consider would be, you know, great to implement um, in uh, this particular area of the Mid-County regarding um again, a, a community that is majority Latino, um, what do you think, what other innovative ideas do you think that should be incorporated there um, to boost uh, this community engagement and participation? Thank you, Councilmember Nevada. I look forward to working with you. Um, I, as a Latina myself, and always uh, really working within immigrant communities and Latino communities, um, I have seen a lot of the barriers that a community faces. I myself have experienced um, many of these barriers. And in terms of best practices, what I have always seen with Latino communities is you have to go to them. You have to go to their spaces. You have to go to their businesses. You need to be where their kids are in school and be present where they are for them to really feel comfortable sharing with you. It's not a position where I ever expect to just sit in my office and expect people to walk in. I have always been one to, you know, walk the streets, walk the businesses, be out there with the community, communicating with them. And I've also realized that Latino uh, communities, primarily when they're recent arrivals, um, need a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication. So it's not like, here's the website to sign up for this new grant. It is, let me sit down with you. Let's talk it through. Let's talk through the paperwork. Let's really have this one-on-one -on -one practice. And something that I'm very proud of that we implemented here in the city of Atlanta that actually rose to a very difficult time through COVID is a community navigator program where we hired members from the community, a lot of them Latina moms who do not even speak English, but we hired them to be our voices within community. Um, similar to promotora programs where they are the people who are out there telling uh, we have courses for them so we teach them and we pay them about government services this is how you access everything from calling to police to how to get a vaccine and really having them because we know that within immigrant communities often people trust their neighbors more than they trust government and so having your neighbor be educated with the right information connected to the right people through this community navigator program I think is a best practice that um, I would potentially like to see implemented here. 
Thank you. One thing you will find out, I know the, your other colleagues know this already, but one thing you will find out about Montgomery County is that we are leaders in best practices. <laughs> so the Promotora program is something we've employed for a very long time, and we took advantage of that element to create the Promotora Salud and Estad initiative, which now has yielded the results that our Latino community actually has a higher vaccination rates than our white residents. Um, so the good news is that we have a lot a lot. We also have a Latino Civic Project that's been very active. Our Small Business Assistance Program in Wheaton, you know, had LEDC, Latino Deve Economic Development Corporation, as a partner. We already have a lot in place. I think that, you know, as somebody who is about to leave the council next year, my humble opinion is that what we need is to take stock of what we have in place, uh, decide which ones are the most effective best practices, and scale them up. Uh, just like the Latino Civic Project, you know, was first in District 4, now it's countywide. I think we need to do that, more of that. And so I look forward to also, um, you know, seeing what all of you as a team can, uh, put, you know, come together and, eat and devise some kind of real cool strategic almost plan for how the regional services centers can do that. Mr. Wins talked about the hubs, the Germantown hub. I mean, that was just so extraordinary. You know what's been happening. Obviously, Silver Spring, Roberto Rodriguez leaves an extraordinary legacy. You know, for Pete, I know that Ken Hartman also leaves an amazing legacy. And I will close by saying this: Jeru Bande, in my opinion, is the godfather of the regional services centers. Use him as a resource because uh, he's had to actually wear, you know, Mid County, East County hat at the same time. But what he's done in the East County really should be a case study. And 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 I know that he can definitely, and he's so generous with his time and his expertise, I think he can be also a catalyst for a lot of what all of you are doing. So congratulations. I'm very excited to to raise my hand and vote for all of you. And Ms. Cabrona, of course, always welcome to, to talk to you. And I think it is just hilarious that, you know, we have Luis Cardona, who apparently people kept congratulating him, and he was not, you know, starting to figure out why, and then, and then we saw that it was because, of course, we now have Luisa Cardona as well with us. <laughs> well said. Thank you. Councilman Rice. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to try and be brief because I know that we're behind schedule. Um, specifically for Mr. Wims, but then for all of the other uh, candidates as well, um, there had been discussions about resources that are available to our regional services centers. Uh, you had a more robust office uh, before that included uh, multiple staff uh, that when we had economic uh, concerns uh, were taken away. Uh, and it made it harder uh, for our regional service center directors to do their jobs as a result. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you feel comfortable in your conversations with the executive branch that you now feel as though uh, there's a structure in place that will allow you to do more work. Uh, certainly with the pandemic, we know that so much has happened, so much recovery efforts will be necessary in our communities, uh, whether it's economic recovery, whether it's connecting people to jobs, whether it's connecting them to continued healthcare, reconnecting them uh, to healthcare, so many other things that are out there that are so important that our regional services center directors do. Do you feel as though you have the support necessary to be able to be successful uh, at continuing the great work of many of our folks who've led this effort. Uh, is that to me first, uh, council member? Yes, I would say that as you know, and all the council members know, my area actually geographically is the largest and we have the most uh, populated area. In talking with uh, the county executive and the chief uh, uh, staff people, they have assured me and the others that there will be additional resources to help us do our job. We do know that with the pandemic, uh, and again, it's not over, uh, and with other issues that will come, we will need additional staff. And they have assured me that they will work with me and the others so that we can get the job done. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know probably all my colleagues have uh, more comments to add, but uh, we're, we're pretty far behind schedule and want to move on uh, to our policy matters. So uh, let me echo the comments that we're all very excited about your nominations. Um, 
we we developed relationships with uh, so many of you over the years and uh, very grateful for your willingness to continue serving Montgomery County and our residents. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we can move on to district council session. And as I mentioned, let's begin with um, item D and then move through the other three. Um, item D is action on ZTA 1907 telecommunications towers limited use. The Fed committee recommended approval with amendments which were further amended by the full council. Um, let me just add a few remarks and I'll turn it over to um, uh, the chairman and to Ms. Ndu. Um, I realize that there's a lot of concerns in this area, both about the policy and the process across the county. Implementation is of 5G is it's one of the most complex and technical issues that have been in front of the county council uh, while I've been here. And um, I know two years ago, I remember um, being told by the administration that they would use the vast technical staff in their shop to send us an executive ZTA a while back that would comply with the FCC order, but we've never seen it. And I just want to mention that as a, as a benchmark. On the process, I've also heard complaints that this legislation is being rushed. Um, and I um, I just wanna correct the record. In fact, an iteration of the ZTA has been before the County Council for over four years because an earlier version of the ZTA was debated during our last term. And this very ZTA has been before us for an unusually long time. It was introduced nearly two years ago in the fall of 2019. So it hasn't technically been rushed at all, quite the contrary. Um, the County Council's held hearings and a town hall and conducted public outreach on this legislation. We've held multiple work sessions, first in the Fed Committee and then in the full council. Um, second, this is an unusual matter in that the council has been put in an unfortunate position um, because of the need to comply with a federal order. We have an, a federal agency who's told us we have to comply with their order and that we're not allowed legally to consider certain community concerns. So regardless of the merits of the issue and how anybody feels about it, I imagine none of my colleagues like being told by a federal agency we have to take action and that our authority is very limited in the details of how we respond to that order. But that's where we are. So I want everybody to understand that as well, regardless of how you feel about the issue. Um, we don't really have the option of remaining out of compliance with federal regulations surrounding 5G. I, I mentioned yesterday at our press conference that if we don't pass something, we put the county at risk of our lawsuit. And within a few hours, I heard multiple times from multiple opponents, um, all well-meaning individuals, um, some I've known for a very long time, saying that's not true. People are entitled to their own opinion on this, but please understand that all of us on the council are supposed to follow legal advice from our county attorney in his office. And yesterday's message on my phone from the county attorney to me says, yes, unless we liberalize our citing rules, we are vulnerable to a legal challenge. So that's the opinion of our county attorney and we're, we're bound to follow that. Everyone's entitled to disagree with the elements of uh, various elements of the CTA. I don't agree with every single detail either, and that's common and complicated legislation, but you can't really argue that we have the opportunity to continue to delay and take no action at all because doing so puts the county at legal risk. Um, and fourth, um, a majority of us for years have supported multiple legal challenges in an effort to test the strength of the FCC order and the county's now exhausted our legal options in multiple court cases, um, while other jur neighboring jurisdictions have moved forward in this area. And as was mentioned during the previous, um, previous item by Councilmember Navarro, the pandemic has shown us how our, how much our society relies more than ever on digital infrastructure and the deep and persistent divides between um, those who have reliable access and those who have not, as well as other disparities in our society that have been spotlighted during this pandemic. So I know there's gonna be a variety of opinions on this CTA. I just want everybody to know that A, this has not been rushed, and B, my colleagues have worked very hard to make the CTA better to protect residents and the environment. We've adopted numerous amendments to address concerns about height, preferential placement, pole proliferation and tree loss minimization. And regardless of what happens today, we can always come back and monitor the implementation and amend the CTA in the near future because legislation is an iterative process. So um, thanks very much to the Fed Committee and all my colleagues for their work on this. Let me turn it over to Chairman Reamer. Thank you, Council President Hucker. Appreciate your comments. I will try to be very brief, uh, but I would like to just uh, confess here um, before I began working on this issue, I did not know how my, my smartphone worked. Uh, I thought when I made a call, maybe a signal was going from my phone to the person I was talking to. 
Uh, I thought maybe my phone was sending a signal to space, to a satellite. I really had no idea how it worked. What I've learned is that our phones, our devices communicate with antennas that are on buildings typically. And when you drive around the county and you look at all of our apartment buildings and our office buildings, strip centers, typically you will see on top of those buildings, small antennas, uh, or I should just say antennas. And that is what our phones are talking to. That's how the signaling works. Those antennas are connected to a fiber network and that is how this whole thing works. Well, that is not a sufficient system for the future of wireless. The future of wireless requires the antennas to be closer to us. They can't be a mile away the way they can be now. They can't be two miles away the way they can be now. They have to be hundreds of feet away. So if we want to allow our wireless networks to grow, and they have to grow because I think we all know the amount of data that we're all using today is exponentially larger than the amount of data that we used to use. If we want to be able to continue to have the best in coverage, the best of service, we've got to allow these antennas to come closer to us on utility poles, on light poles. And that's what this ZTA is seeking to accomplish, is to allow for small antennas to be placed where they're needed. It's not something that you know, most of us will ever think about once it happens. We don't typically think about what is on those poles today. There's a lot of equipment on those poles today. It's not something that we're going to relish looking at, just like none of us loves looking at our home Wi-Fi router. However, we rely upon that router for our professional lives, our social lives, our entertainment. You know, they're a deep part of living in the world today. And these antennas will be no different. Many of the criticisms that we're hearing are founded in health claims. And I just refer everyone to the FDA, the National Cancer Institute, the CDC, the American Cancer Society, the World Health Organization. Scientific authorities are very clear that there is no compelling evidence of a health concern from our devices. And so if you accept that, if you trust the science, then what is the argument to restrict the infrastructure? What is the argument to have an inadequate wireless network? So that is how, that's where we are now. We are, we are proposing to allow for the deployment of more infrastructure so the county will not be left behind. And I really want to thank my colleagues, especially council members Albernose and Rice. Um, you know, the last council struggled with this mightily. And at the beginning of this council, you both co-sponsored as leads on this zoning change and provided the force that we needed to move forward. Council members Friedson and Jawando, our detailed work at committee produced a very thoughtful zoning change with a lot of the community protections that were requested. And I think you helped craft something that council members can stand behind and they can explain and they can defend. So this is not an easy vote. I'm still getting, you know, inquiries from chatter about neighborhood listservs and things like that. But uh, I always rely on the adage, people want progress without change. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, that's really not op not usually the op the uh, an option. So um, I thank my my colleagues for their careful deliberation. I thank the community for all of the participation and we have an amended zoning change, uh, zoning text amendment from the Fed committee for the council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you, council member Jawanda. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I appreciate the, the chair's comments and the work at the Fed committee uh, and all the work of staff uh, on this. This is uh, to put it mildly, uh, I think I know why uh, our former colleague, Jeff Zients, retired. I think uh, Ms. Nadu and I were talking about that. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Ms. Nadu, you know, I, I, I often, I think people know, if, you know, if you don't know, I am an, 
an attorney. I'm barred in the state of Maryland and the only one on the council right now. Uh, and so one of the things that's been particularly challenging for me uh, is the litigation. And when we considered this uh, last time, uh, you know, last year pre-pandemic, there were several cases that we were party to that were pending. Um, several of those have been resolved, some of which partially in favor, partially in not. There is a, a current lawsuit uh, that is before the D.C. Circuit of the Court of Appeals, federal court. So one of the highest, some consider the second highest court in the land. It appeals directly to the Supreme Court. That is challenging directly the FCC's 5G radio frequency guidelines. Um, the oral arguments in this case were heard in January. There is an imminent uh, ruling pending from this, again, the second highest court in the land. Two Obama appointed federal judges in the oral arguments, you know, which is often common, raised significant concerns with the fact that the FCC has not updated their safety guidelines since 1996. Uh, and one judge, uh, Judge Wilkins, went so far as to assert that he was inclined to rule against the FCC because there had been no reference to uh, the work, two working groups, federal working groups, that are charged with reviewing the safety of these guidelines. So uh, I just want to ask Ms. Nadu, if what are the plaintiffs asking for as far as relief in this case, and if they were successful, would that potentially impact uh, the what we would have to be able to do here at the local level? Sure. Uh, so, good, well, good afternoon, council members. Um, so the plaintiff in this case is Environmental Health Trust. Um, and what they asked the court to do is to remand, vacate, or they asked the court to order the FCC to remand, vacate, and update their RF exposure guidelines, um, which are 25 years old. Um, so there's two things that can happen. Um, one, if the court rules in the petitioner's favor, then of course the FCC could appeal that to the Supreme Court, so it would keep going. Um, but the other thing that could happen is the FCC would have to re-examine its RF standards, um, which would of course slow down the 2018 FCC order. I can't say for sure if that means the order itself, like in full, would be repealed. Um, but if the court does remand, vacate, and order them to update their standards, they would have to do so. I appreciate it. But that, so that's a possibility. It is a possibility that the 2018 order, which we are presumably acting upon in, in, because we fear litigation, could be uh, rescinded or, or put, could be put on hold while the guidelines are updated. That is a potential outcome. It's a potential outcome, although I will say the order itself is pretty long, so they might only, you know, Certainly. they could only pause like that part but still encourage deployment. It, it would depend how, the, exactly what the court order said as well. Got it. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, you know, so for me, you know, I, I think, you know, I've weighed on this a lot, and uh, I don't know whether it's safe or not, and we're not allowed to consider that under the current order. Uh, but what I do know is that technology advances a lot in 25 years. Um, and, you know, and Council Member Reeve, Reamer referenced the American Cancer Society. I'm going to read from their website. At this time, there's no strong evidence that exposure to RF waves from cell phones towers cause any noticeable health effects. However, this does not mean that RF waves from cell phone towers have been proven to be absolutely safe. Most experts organizations agree that more research is needed to help clarify this, especially for any possible long-term health effects. That's on the website for the American Cancer Society. I, again, I don't know, but that's part of the problem. I don't know. And that there is a current case in the second highest court of the land that could totally change what we do. And I voted and committed to move this forward uh, because I think we needed to have a full council discussion about it. Um, and reasonable, and we will need to do 5G and te wireless technology will advance and it will happen at some point. And it already has happened. We have 5G in commercial centers. We have in our municipalities, there's some deployment. Uh, it will, there will be technological advance and it should happen. 
Uh, but it bothers me, and history tells me that, uh, you know, I don't know if it's safe, but I do know that if it's not, industry wouldn't care. <laughs> I know that. And so uh, I think taking a step to let, allow the court to decide which could happen imminently in the month of August is a, a prudent step. If they uphold the order, I'll be the first one to vote for it the next day um, because we got to move forward and we have to be remain competitive. There are advantages. Uh, I hope that they update the guidelines. And so for that reason, uh, I can in good conscience support uh, the final DPTA today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. So it's really interesting. You know, um, it, it, it's interesting because when people talk about health care effects, they never talk about the fact that this cell phone right here uh, is more of a risk of RF uh, transmission than a tower would be. So if you're really concerned about the health effects, put down your cell phones, get away, take out your microwave ovens from your house, all those kinds of things. So let's just be real, right? So let's not be the alarmist who tries to make it seem as though you know, we're doing something that's going to jeopardize this, the health and safety of our community. Many of us have thought about that. And although we can't think about it in terms of how we vote on this particular ZTA, it doesn't mean that we don't think about it. We're still human beings. We still have families. We have children who will be near these things. So we, of course, care about it. So let's just be real about the fact that, yes, we consider this. We're the same council who, you know, ban. Uh, or who made it mandatory to do radon testing. Why? Because radon is proven, right, proven uh, to cause uh, cancer, to cause lung cancer. And so we took steps. I led that effort. Uh, so we do care about health. We do care about causing cancer. We are concerned about those kinds of things. So, yes, um, while we can't, in consideration of moving this ETA forward, say that this is a reason why we shouldn't do it, it doesn't mean that we don't think about it, that we don't care about it, and we wouldn't move forward if we thought that we were doing something that was dangerous, period. So let me just make that clear. Now, when it comes to access, I've seen so many people who've talked about uh, racial equity and social justice. And so I want to talk about the myriad of emails and calls that we've gotten into the office. And they say, oh, it hasn't been analyzed for racial equity and social justice. Well, the reality is this, it has been. We, for a long time, said it's one of the reasons why we passed the racial equity and social justice law, because we identified so many things in our communities that were disparate for those people who were of lower socioeconomic status and who were oftentimes disconnected from technology. And that is our black and brown community, our communities that always struggle. The thing is this, is that even with robust fiber, and many of you know I led the National Association of Counties Broadband Task Force. So for over a year, we worked on comprehensive methodology to achieve racial equity and social justice when it came to uh, getting to our neighborhoods that didn't have access to high-speed broadband. Uh, the reality is, is that even in those urban areas, the people can't afford it. And so the key is, is that having this 5G will actually give an alternative. It is not the same as having hardwired 5G going into your homes, but at least it's something that gets that connectivity there that gives them a fighting chance that they don't have right now. And while we continue to work with the federal government on ways to affect that change, the reality is, is that folks still get left behind. So if you are a person who wrote in and who cares about racial equity and social justice, you should be supporting 5G. You should be rallying and saying, we need to do this for all of the poor black and brown people who have no access to high quality and high speed broadband right now. So don't write me again talking about racial equity and social justice without knowing the facts. That's the reality. That's what our folks experience each and every day. I've talked to them. I've worked over the past year across this country talking to folks who don't have that access. So stop it, okay? If you don't like it, if you feel as though it's, you know, something that's dangerous and that's how you feel, I completely understand that. But please don't hide behind the auspices of racial equity and social justice when in reality it's the exact opposite. The reality is, is that the majority of people are looking for ways to try and keep their families connected, so much so that they would bring their children 
and put them in the parking lots of their jobs just so they could log on to Zoom and make sure that they had access to their classwork and their classmates. That's what happened during this pandemic. That's what we saw. That's why the impetus is upon us to make this happen. That is why we need to move forward with this bill and we need to make sure that we're striking a blow when it comes to ensuring that we can get affordable, high quality access for people throughout this country, not just here in the state of Maryland. And just lastly, when it comes to, you know, Councilmember Juano's comment about the court case, but there are always gonna be court cases. They're always gonna be. There's, there's gonna be another court case filed shortly that I've heard about uh, in California. Um, so, you know, court cases will continue to pop up. If you want to keep waiting for court cases to be exhausted, you'll never get it done. Uh, the reality is, is that you have to move at some point. Now, as more information comes about, obviously, if a court case comes down and changes where things are, not just us here in Little Montgomery County, but across the United States of America, we'll have to make adjustments based on what that ruling is. So this affects more than just Montgomery County. So this isn't something that is just isolated to us. This is something that would be impactful on the entire country and everyone who has these regulations in place. And like I said, again, it doesn't stop. There is no such thing as an exhausting of all the options. There will always be things for those opponents who just feel as though they don't like it um, or fear that it may cause some sort of risk that will continue to fight that. That's the American way. That's how our court system is set up and structured. Um, but we can at the same time allow that to dictate for us what it is that we need to do if we believe that it's the right thing moving forward. And so I'll say this, I believe it's the right thing moving forward. I believe under the auspices of racial equity and social justice, it is the right thing for us to do. I believe when it comes to supporting our folks in our rural areas that I represent in the agricultural reserve, it is the right thing to do. I believe that when it comes to the telecommunications efforts that are gonna be there and the technology that needs to be there to help move our economy forward, that it's the right thing to do. I believe that this ETA is the right way for us to move forward. Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I am gonna be brief. I had made a statement last week. I have not changed my mind. I'm not going to vote for this uh, legislation. I sincerely appreciate all of the efforts and, and uh, of all of my colleagues and all their hard work. I believe that we should wait until mid-September. We're not talking about waiting forever. We're talking about literally a few weeks. In the meantime, we should be getting back the court case uh, from what uh, Council Member Juwanda was discussing. I don't believe we would be harming anyone by doing that. Uh, the, and I believe that if we did wait until mid-September, that we would have more answers before us. I, I understand that there, uh, I, I um, understand that this legislation has been made better by the amendments. I voted for those amendments, knowing, believing, uh, that, that this legislation was going to go forward and you come up with the best legislation you can, even though you're not supportive of the legislation. So I did support those amendments, but I believe that we are making an error by voting on this at this time until we know uh, what the outcome of our, the, the one case that Council Member Juwanda would discuss and others. I believe we should wait until mid-September, and because of that, I will be voting against this legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I turn it back to you. Council Vice President Albernoz. Thanks. I know we're way over. Um, disappointed in some of the comments of my colleagues, but I'll let that go for now. Um, I think that uh, this has clearly been deliberated and discussed for over six years. And as I've stated publicly before, I really commend our central staff who've done a fantastic job in coordinating a lot of complex information, which you unanimously voted out of a committee by all of my colleagues. Uh, and so I want to thank them for, and the Fed committee, all of its members for their deliberative efforts and not feeding into the misinformation that has been sent through a variety of different 
uh, means to our residents. Uh, we, of course, care about the public safety of our residents. And we also have to acknowledge and understand that the innovations in technology are critical, not just for public safety, but also for economic development. And uh, every other jurisdiction across this country is wrestling with these similar issues, uh, and most, particularly in our region, have already advanced and have already moved forward. And so we're behind. And so we can, as Councilmember Rice noted, uh, wait for all of the myriad of court cases, which will continue uh, to move forward. And I have a high degree of confidence in this presidential administration and the appointments that he has made, both within the FCC and in the other corresponding agencies who are responsible for making these decisions in doing what's best in the interest of all of our county residents and all of our citizens across this country. And so I have a high degree of confidence in our federal system. And I also have a high degree of confidence that by passing this legislation today, uh, we will advance racial equity by ensuring better Wi-Fi and better connectivity for parts of our community that don't have access to it. And that it will also lead to a lot of other uh, um, tremendous benefits as well. The pros, in my humble opinion, significantly outweigh the cons. And waiting until September is not going to garner any other significant pieces of information other than delaying what has been a conversation that's been going on for six years. So this is a difficult vote. I know there are people that are passionately opposed to this. I respect their positions, but uh, in my estimation, this is progress and something that we as a community need to move forward. Thank you. Council Member Nevado. Okay, Mr. President, um, let me first thank the Fed Committee, um, all of the stakeholders, all the constituents that have chimed in, and um, Council Members Rice and Albernos for also the sponsorship of this of this CTA. As everybody knows, I, I didn't um, I didn't arrive at this point easily because when we first began to have this conversation, there were a lot of outstanding questions. Uh, and so we've had this conversation now for a good, I think it's, what, five years or something like that since we first began to have some conversations. Uh, and, you know, I I like to take my time. I like to listen to, to different perspectives. I also like to understand what is happening, not just locally, but regionally and globally, um, because inevitably we are in uh, sort of a protagonist position here in Montgomery County when it comes to this region, when it comes to the country, and when it comes to the world. Uh, and a lot has happened. So much has happened in 2020 that has come to, I think, show us a lot of different uh, kinds of permanent changes that are not going to go away. And there's a lot that is being examined right now. You know, what's going to happen with telecommuting? What is going to happen with telehealth? What were the lessons that we learned regarding addressing issues of disparities that were positive, positively impacted by the use of technology. These things have been accelerated, and I mentioned this earlier in another item. The pandemic has accelerated a lot of these changes in a permanent way. So I understand, because I was one of those people who thought, well, maybe we can take some time, maybe we can think about this, et cetera. This experience of this pandemic seeing it from all of the different perspectives and for us being responsible to address all of the policy areas at once has come to show me in particular that there is no way that we can stand in the way of this change. It has happened. And during a lot of conversations at this, you know, Council of Governments retreat with elected leadership from all over the region, one of the things that came up a few times because we were focusing on issues of equity was how now equity sometimes gets co-opted to be used accordingly to, pers you know, to push or justify certain positions. How can we sit here and somehow say the better access somehow is rooted in inequity and it works against our push for racial equity and social justice when we have seen time and time and time and time again, not only research, but we saw with our own eyes during this pandemic how it is about access, how it is about shared prosperity. That's what we're trying to achieve here. 
And so, yes, I know these moments are very difficult because it is groundbreaking in many ways and the change is happening so rapidly. I understand that. But at some point, we're going to have to decide, like, do we choose to stay behind or are we going to step up and meet this moment, which by now it's almost like already left us behind. (laughs) That's where we are. So I associate myself with some of the comments of my colleagues that, you know, it's a new administration. I feel better about that. And there will be things that maybe we will have to tweak. But to just pretend that somehow 2020 didn't happen, to pretend that we don't have to rely, God forbid, we have to get into another major wave. I mean, for me, the thought of us in the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee having conversations about, you know, regulations about teleworking and pilots for teleworking and in the Education Committee talking about possible, out, you know, online education, what would it look like in the future? And literally within 24 hours, we had to do it all, all of it. That is just so extraordinary. And so this, to me, is something that we have to do. Other jurisdictions around the region have already done it. Why would we in Montgomery County choose to say no and wait and wait and wait? So. Again, I, I absolutely respect all of the stakeholders who have contacted us, both pros and cons. I totally respect that. Um, this, like I have done in all of my public life, this vote is not because, well, you know, somebody's going to give her some contribution or not. <laughs> this is based on meeting a moment that we cannot ignore. And um, that is why I think that, you know, the original CTA has been amended significantly, and I appreciate that. Um, and I will be voting yes to the amended CTA today. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Reamer. Thank you. Um, appreciate my colleagues' comments. I just wanted to add, we're talking about the science here a bit. Um, One of the things I've had to get my head around is the scientific method as a whole. The scientific method always calls for more research. It rarely states something as an absolute certainty. It always says more research is helpful. What it also does is it looks at all of the studies together. And one of the things that we've been experiencing through this conversation is the selective use of certain studies constantly being, you know, brought forward and given disproportionate weight by certain actors. What the scientific agencies do, the National Cancer Institute, the FDA, CDC, the World Health Organization, what they do is they look at all the studies and they add them all up into a ledger and they say, what is most compelling? What studies bring the strongest evidence? That is the scientific process here. And there's no real argument among those agencies. They all arrive at the same conclusion. There is a institute based in Bethesda. It's called the National Center for Radiation Safety. Uh, it's headquartered in Montgomery County. The scientists there have been working on these issues for decades. I've spoken with them. They are very clear that the radio frequency emissions on one side of the spectrum are a very, very uh, limited risk, and those on the other side are very high risk. That's your x-rays and all those other things. But the spectrum kind of breaks in half and everything on the non-ionizing side has been found over uh, more than 100 years now not to be dangerous. It's the same thing as AM, FM radio. And when radio was started, people said that birds were dropping out of the sky from radio waves. Um, You know, it's our home Wi-Fi. It's non-ionizing radiation. 
if you believe it's dangerous, you should turn off your Wi-Fi. And, and honestly, if we really believed it was dangerous, we should ban Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, do we really believe it's dangerous? No. If we did, we would act, you know? Um, so the scientific method, you have to be comfortable with a little bit of more research is needed as a, as a concept. Uh, at the same time, trusting in, I'm willing to trust in the authorities that are charged with this responsibility. Colleagues know at times I have taken controversial views, uh, controversial positions on issues like polystyrene. We banned polystyrene because I was convinced that there was an issue there. Uh, we banned uh, lawn pesticides, you know, but chemicals and radio, radio frequency waves are extremely different. And that's something that the chief scientist explained to me. You know, a chemical could have unknown impacts. Radio frequency waves generally have very known impacts, whatever part of the spectrum they're from on the non-ionizing side. So in any event, I think with the NIH, the FDA, the National Center for Radiation Safety, all headquartered in Montgomery County, uh, we would be well advised to follow their guidance. Uh, there are thousands of employees who are our constituents. And uh, last thing I'll say, there is a correlation between the extreme views on this issue and other issues like vaccine criticism, anti-vax and anti-5G, there's common ground there. There are 5G conspiracies about microchips being implanted in vaccines. You've heard about that. This is what our community is being inundated with, day in and day out, with this disinformation. And our job is to sift through it all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ndu, I think the floor is yours. I actually don't have too much to add today um, since this is scheduled for um, vote and not work session. I will say I have attendees here uh, logged in, staff from OZA and planning, DPS, TEBS, and the executive if there's any additional questions. Uh, the version of the ZTA that is in front of you includes all the amendments both from Fed committee and from the last two work sessions. Um, so, yeah, I can go through the details of it if the council would like. Otherwise, I give the floor back to you. Okay, if there's any requests for details, please let me know from my colleagues, but um, seeing none, um, we have a recommendation from the Fed Committee with uh, amendments, which were further amended by the full council. All those in favor of the Fed Committee recommendation, please raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry, we a roll call vote. Yes. Yes, this is a roll call. Madam Clerk, yes, please. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Jawando? No. Mr. Jawando votes no. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? No. Mr. Katz votes no. Mr. Albernoff? Yes. Mr. Albernoff votes yes. And Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Okay, colleagues, do um, you prefer to break now for lunch and take the rest of the district council uh, matters up after lunch, or do you want to keep going through? I would say there. I don't think there's much discussion needed on them as we had our straw vote. So right. I'd be happy to move quickly through them if that's what you would recommend to us. And sure, why not? That would free up uh, all of those who may be here for that part of the agenda. That's fine. Good point. Okay. Item 4A is the introduction zoning text amendment 2105 Rural Village Center Overlay Zone Vehicle Repair. Public hearing. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's just an introduction. Public hearing is scheduled for 9-14-21 at 1.30 p.m. 
Item 4B is action on subdivision regulation amendment SRA 2101 exemptions, alcohol production, and agro-tourism. The Fed Committee recommends approval with amendments. Thank you. And we discussed this one previously. Um, I don't know that we need to discuss it again. We've had a straw vote. So there right. are amended DTAs before you. Thank you. Ma Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Gawando? Yes. Mr. Gawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Abernoff? Yes. Mr. Abernoff votes yes. And Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Uh, Hucker votes yes. Thank you. That item passes. Item 4C is action on ZTA 2101 sign ordinance bus shelter advertising. The Fed Committee also recommends approval with amendments. Um, there's no comp. Mr. Chairman, anything? If not, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Glass? Yes. Glass votes yes. Mr. Duwando? Yes. Mr. Duwando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Abernoff? Yes. Mr. Abernoff votes yes. And Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. That item passes as well. Item 4E is action, addition to the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings Comprehensive Fee Schedule. The GO Committee recommends approval. Madam Chair, anything to add? Just to say that this fee is in response to CTA 20-01 solar collection systems, AR zone standards, which allow for solar panels to be installed in the Ag Reserve as a conditional use, approval for facilities larger than 200% of on-site energy use, but less than 2 megawatts. And so this is to establish um, a fee. OZA and plan the planning department proposed the fee to be $8,200 and to that, for that to be added to the fee schedule with 25% of the fee going to planning. This is the same amount as the current agricultural processing fee and the uh, GO committee uh, voted um, and approved this three to zero. Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk. This is a hand vote, Mr. President. Uh, you're right. I'm sorry. My bad. Um, all those in favor of addition, uh, move, uh, approving the additions to the comprehensive fee schedule, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Terrific. Thank you. And then finally, let's take up the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Councilmember Rice moves. Councilmember Navarro seconds. All those in favor of approving the consent calendar, please raise your hand. Great. That is unanimous as well. Now we can take our, uh, we want to take recess till 1.30, I guess so. Okay. Since people will be coming in. All right. We'll see you all at 1.30. Thank you. Discrimination. And you can simply keep reinforcing that um, the laws provide open um, conversation, no um, bullying, no overt discrimination, surely. But also another thing that I have trouble doing, but I make myself do it, is when somebody is telling a fad joke, do something, um, say something. And um, and it doesn't matter if you're disliked for it. It's, it's still the right thing to do.